Tuesday, February 22nd. I'll call to order the Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022, Town Council Committee of the Whole Meeting at 632. For roll call, all counselors are present. Uh, with the exception of Councillor Parker, she will be late as she is at a TVCCA meeting. Calendar and communications, Councillor Kassiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on February 10th, I attended a tour of the Town Hall Annex and Public Works Building. Thank you to Mr. Reiner and Mr. Hanover for those presentations. On February 12th, I volunteered at the Super Bowl put on by Thrive 55, which was a fun community event. Thank you to the staff and all the um, local restaurants for donating. On February 17th, I attended the personnel and appointments meeting. On February 19th, I attended the tour at the water pollution control facility where I learned a great deal about our wastewater treatment. Thank you to the town staff for that tour. And I watched the temporary rules meeting and also watched the town attorney RFP interviews and received various emails about the data center, former Noank School property, and old Mystic Town Green. Thank you. Councilor Westerville. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, um, let's see, on February 10th, I was able to go to the Connecticut Celebrates the Coast Guard event up at the State House with Representative Anthony Nolan. Uh, it was a great event, they huge displays, um, lots of lots of folks, a lot of uh, talk about the upcoming museum. Um, it was a, a really great event, very well attended. Also on the 17th of February, I attended the personal appointments uh, committee meeting. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to see uh, faces up close and um, Yes, uh, so on Tuesday, February 15th, I attended a City Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. On a Wednesday, February 16th, attended a Long-Term Recovery Committee, uh, also with um, uh, Mayor Melendez and Council Bordelon. Um, <clears throat> on Thursday, February 17th, um, we held our Town Council Personal Employment Committee meeting. Um, on uh, Friday, um, February 18th, had the uh, distinct privilege of um, sitting down with uh, Lieutenant Governor Susan Beiswitz. Um, uh, this past weekend, uh, on Saturday, at the privilege of attending the uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, facility tour with uh, Councilors Kassiri, um, Councilor uh, Jones, uh, Mayor Melendez, and uh, Councilor McBride. Uh, thank you again to um, Manager uh, Town Manager Burt uh, for uh, hosting the tour. Um, and uh, it was very informative, and also had the privilege of attending the um, Mystic's uh, Celebration of Black Literature at the Mystic River Park. Uh, Councillors uh, Mayor Melendez and uh, Councillor Parker um, gave a very poignant and, and um, quite frankly, uh, moving w remarks, and just want to thank you both for, for your words, and um, nothing further to report. Thank you. Councilor Borlon. Uh, thank you. Um, I, too, attended the long-term recovery uh, meeting on February 16th. Uh, I also attended personal appointment on Thursday the 17th, attended our temporary rules committee, received tons of emails um, regarding town attorney, data centers, oral school, um, and many others. Also had the privilege to attend uh, Fitch High School fencing tournament. Um, and looking forward to states coming up this uh, Saturday. Um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, ECC's this Saturday, followed by states the following uh, Saturday. Um, and that's all I have to report today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I attended the uh, Celebration of Black Literature put on by uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the Mystic Noak Library. I want to thank them for putting that on and also um, allowing me to speak at their event. Councilor Franco. I attended the rules meeting. I watched the personnel and appointments meeting. Um, I had communications regarding the data center and some other topics um, regarding some items around town. And um, I do have a question pertaining to the long-term recovery committee that was just brought up. I, I don't recall 
who is assigned to that committee. So if we have a moment, at, if you could send out an email on that. Um, and there will be, I'm just gonna notate that this Thursday, I guess the Economic Development Committee and the Conservation Committee will be putting on a meeting regarding data centers here at the Senior Center. And um, so our community can come, come out and ask questions and hear the presentation and actually hear some facts about what's actually going on. Because um, there's been a lot of <clears throat> misinformation floating around on social media again. So thank you. Council Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also visited the uh, Planning Department and Public Works and the wastewater uh, treatment facility, which was quite interesting. Um, I also completed, our, as the town council rep, for the RFP process for the town attorney. We completed that this past week. Um, attended the Super Bowl Saturday at Thrive 55, which was a lot of fun for all the attendants. I think it was extremely well attended. We had probably over 100 participants and then some great, great participation by town councilors and various emails um, on different topics. Thank you, Councilor McBride. Thank you, Mayor. I also attended the tour on Saturday over at the UCA facility. Also had a personal appointments meeting that was on the 17th. Also joined uh, LB Late, the uh, Temporary Rules Committee, last week as well, and received numerous emails that all the other individuals, councilors, have received as well. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bird, I see a hand. It's one of Tyler's. Um, one of the Tyler people. Okay. I don't know where the hand would be up. I'll right. be to him in just a minute. <laughs> you might want to make sure he can share a screen, maybe. Okay. All right, so we're moving on to the approval of minutes, which can be found on page three. I make a motion to approve the committee the whole meeting minutes of February 8th, 2022. So moved. Second from Bernie. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Baumgartner. Any discussion? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That carries unanimously. Eight in favor, zero opposed, zero abstaining. On to new business. 2022-108. October 1st, 2021, town-wide revaluation can be found on page eight. And we have Cindy here to give us an update. My video is not working. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, joining us tonight, we have um, two people from Tyler Technologies and also Mary Gardner, the assessor, who are going to, Mary's going to start off with a, a brief overview, and then the two um, gentlemen from Tyler's are going to give us a little bit more information on the process and the end results of the um, 21 revamp. So at this time, I will turn it over to Mary. Cindy. Welcome, everyone. Um, as you all know, uh, we just completed the October 1st, 2021 reval, and um, we'd like to give you an overview and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I'm sure you realize that state statute requires that we reval properties in Connecticut every five years. Um, the goal is to bring the real estate values to the current market value as of your assessment date, in this case, October 1st, 2021. Connecticut, it is an ad-valorem state, which means that your taxes are based on the value of your property, and that's for all of our taxable grand lists, motor vehicle and personal property as well. Revaluation targets the real estate grand list, and it brings the assessment level to 70%. And this um, goal is to equalize the tax burden in the distribution across the board. If you watch the uh, video that um, my office made for GMTV, we touched on how motor vehicle and personal property grant lists are always at 70% assessment level. 
whereas real estate fluctuates, the only time it's really at 70% is the year that you do the revaluation, and then depending on market forces, it can either uh, decrease or increase from that point. Our last reval was 2016. I know that the residents have been following the sales of real estate and they're aware that the values have changed dramatically since 2016. And I'd like to say that Tyler has performed the last five revaluations for Broughton beginning in 2001. And they're very familiar with the town and its unique neighborhoods. Uh, my office has a very good working relationship with their staff and their project managers. And with us tonight is Kevin Rake from Tyler, regional manager of the central, southern, and part of the mid-Atlantic areas. And also John Valenti, who is a real estate appraiser and consultant. Um, I just want to open up with a little background on what we did when we kicked off the revaluation. We mailed a four-page brochure to all property owners in February of 2021. That brochure outlined the uh, revaluation timetable. It included a question and answer per page, and it provided phone direct contact with myself and the project manager. So Kevin is going to touch on the residential. John is going to touch on the commercial. But I'm just going to make a couple of bullet points about residential. And then Kevin, if you're OK, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and then when you're finished, I will pick up with a couple of points on residential, and then I'll turn it over to John. So our last full measure in this project was 2011. This reval is the 10th year, so it was also considered a full measure in list project. We use data mailers as uh, accepted under state statute as a substitute for a physical inspection. And at the time that that legislation was passed, the legislators felt that that was an acceptable method. Um, data mailers are useful because, especially with COVID-19 restrictions, uh, we were very uh, aware of the consideration of the public health and safety of our residents. Uh, it's, my office instituted a data, ma data mailer program three years leading up to the revaluation where we segmented all the 14 residential neighborhoods into different years and then we uh, mailed out by neighborhood and so we covered two or three neighborhoods a year for three years leading up to the reval. Most Connecticut towns now use a data mailer format because it, it, it is a cost savings to the town and I understand that we saved $46,000 by using this program for Broughton. Um, we had a pretty good public awareness campaign. We updated the assessment webpage regularly, regularly on which neighborhoods the data collectors would be visiting. Um, and as part of the project, once um, the values were in, I physically visited all the, the uh, 14 neighborhoods um, and, and did my own review of Tyler's work, which is required by the state statute. So with that, Kevin, I know my overview is brief. I have some points um, between you and I. We will touch on these points, but I wanted to, to let you pick up from here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. And Council, thanks you, uh, thank you for having me here today. And I would like to point out, I am a bit intimate with Groton. Um, I was the project supervisor in 2001 when um, Tyler did the uh, reassessment in 2001. So I, I do have some history in Groton and, and some familiarity there with uh, all 14 neighborhoods and, and many of the areas of Groton. Um, to that end, I would like to start off just by uh, reviewing the process. Uh, we started the project in September of 2020. Uh, beginning with planning, uh, how we were going to go about the discovery phase of the project, moving into our analytics, then into valuation, the final review of the, the, the preliminary review of value, more analytics, uh, informal reviews, all of those different steps leading up to today, 
Um, beginning with the discovery, there are 13,000 plus properties in Groton and 14 neighborhoods. Three of those neighborhoods were designated for site visits. Uh, the balance were, were designated for data mailers. Uh, we did all site visits on those three neighborhoods, which exceeded somewhere around 5,800 properties. There were also uh, site visits on new construction, permits, sales, and quality control properties. So we, we covered a lot of ground. Um, when, we, when we reviewed properties in, in Groton, I believe the three neighborhoods that we've targeted for site visits were uh, West Mystic, Mystic Village, and Groton Long Point. I think there were 5,829 properties in those in those property in those three neighborhoods together. Uh, the return on the data mailers, we received 53% of the data mailers in return after mailing those. Um, every property that did transfer, uh, that did sell, we went through a sales validation process by which we did a site visit. There were sales questionnaires mailed, uh, interviews with, with uh, new homeowners. Uh, those, uh, the sales are so key to the valuation process because they are the cornerstone to the tables that we utilize when we, when we develop our values. After the sales have been validated, we go through the process of calibrating the modules that we are used, that are used to produce value for both land and building. Uh, for land, we look at vacant land sales in Groton. We also use a technique of reviewing sales residuals where we have properties that do have homes on them. We reduce that sale price by the, uh, the value of the improvements, leaving just the land value. And through those two avenues, we've been able to update the land tables that have been uh, in place for for almost two decades now. They've been well vetted. They've been exercised for many, many years. And those, along with the building value, produce a replacement cost new less depreciation that added to the land value produced an appraised value. The building values were calibrated using two uh, techniques. One is looking at Marshall Swift pricing manuals. It's a nationally recognized pricing manual that we initially use to dial in our, our, our building schedules. And then we look at new home construction in Groton to fine tune our, our uh, replacement cost tables. Again, those two numbers combined produce the, the, the appraised value. After that, uh, we go to the field. We review each and every property in the field, each value. That was done by uh, our appraisers, led by our project supervisor, Monique Newcomb. Uh, then we go through a series of statistical analyses to make certain that there's no bias within, um, within any of those property types. In the, in the sales analysis, we uh, reviewed over 550 sales, and we were um, at 67% of assessment, or 95% of value. After that process, we then do an informal review where we mail notices to taxpayers in December and give them an opportunity to come in and talk to us about their properties. There were over 12,000 notices mailed and 637 properties participated in the informal process, about 5% of the properties, which is a bit on the light side, but I think that because of the um, economic environment in, that we're in, I think that sort of tempered the number of people who came. Um, if you broke the residentials down by single family condo or mobile home, the single families at condos went increased from 2020 to 2021, uh, about 30%, where mobile homes was just shy of 40% at 38%. 
two families at 36% and three families at 28%. The overall for the residential was 29%. And the increase in the grand list was 22%. Um, Mary, is, is there anything there that you think I, I should touch on a little further? No, I, I think you covered everything. You mentioned new construction uh, used to calibrate costs. The depreciation is studied during every revaluation. A lot of people refer to revaluations as <clears throat> Um, physical or statistical. We do statistics in every single revaluation. Um, one thing that we did do, Kevin, was the quality assurance program for the data mailer project, where as part of the state statute guidelines, every town has to develop a quality assurance program. Statutes don't tell you how to do it. So we reached out, both myself and Monique, to the State of Connecticut OPM liaison and um, let them know that we were going to be visiting 10% of our return data mailers as a quality assurance program. We would make sure the data was good. If we had questions, we would reach out to the property owner. That was completed. Um, I believe that paid real dividends also. When we, when we looked at the total number of data mailers mailed that covered the entire spectrum of properties from sales, quality control, the areas that were not designated for site visits, and we also went so far as to mail data mailers to the properties where we did do site visits. So where there are uh, 10,700 uh, improved properties, we mailed close to 12,000 between the two of us, 12,000 data mailers. Uh, there was a lot, there was some redundancy there, but I think that's okay. Great. And you know, the return rate is pretty typical, I think, for our program. Um, well, all things considered, the return rate typically are for those parcels where a correction needs to be made. Uh, in many cases, there's no correction to be made, and the property owner will keep those data mailers for their own record. Uh, and there was no need uh, to, to send those in because the data was correct. Um, I think that covers residential. Do any of the counselors have any questions? Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have um, two questions. One is, can you just tell what the uh, percent of commercial industrial versus homes is in the town? How does that sort of break down? Yeah, what I'd like to do is um, allow John Valenti to speak. We'll go through his process and then we can cover that. Okay. I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, Councilor Parker just arrived. Okay, that's at 656. Is there any way we could fix the audio at all? Add internet connection. It's the internet connection? I think so. Thank you. Was that answered? Was, is he going to answer, answer that question? Well, um, She's doing uh, maybe I, I wasn't audio wasn't clear. I said I'd like to let John Valenti speak next on the commercial process and then we can go over the differences between commercial and residential outcome. Okay. Okay. I have a second question after that too. What was your second question? Uh, I didn't sec hear. The second question, uh, just reading through the, through the back of the report, um, it mentions that we had seven housing starts in Groton in 2021. It just seems like an awful low number. I mean, I don't know, is that normal that we only have seven or is it because of COVID or? That is pretty normal. And I think they're mostly up in the Northwest corner of the town off Imogen Drive. Um, I think there was one in the city, but that was for 2020. So there, there have not been a lot of new housing starts. So we're just not building new houses in the, in the town? No. Okay. Okay, then I'll wait for the answer for the other one then. 
Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation on the residential areas. My first question is, um, compared to the last time we had a, a reval, um, how do we determine which neighborhoods you're physically going to go out and do a actual property assessment um, in-house? Um, and why, why these three particular zones? Why were those chosen? So when I devised the schedule for Broughton, and we started in 2017, so 17, 18, and 19, we sent data mailers out. When 2020 came, my office, uh, I lost an assistant assessor, and we hired one, and then she retired about eight months after. We hired another one, and she left for another job about nine months after. So we were short staffed, so it was on our list to do. We didn't get it done. So as a result, Tyler wrapped it into their program. And instead of sending data mailers, they just physically inspected all three neighborhoods and then gathered the data, data entered the data, and then they mailed out data mailers to those three neighborhoods to give the property owners the opportunity to say that the data was correct or needed some kind of um, nudging. I, maybe I missed the, an the answer I was looking for. Maybe I worded it wrong. How come these three areas were chosen and, and did you choose other areas in the past? Because you said Old Mystic, GLP. Why these particular areas and not, say, um, some other neighborhoods? Why only those particular ones? When I, when I set out that schedule over the four-year period, I broke it down by the number of parcels within each neighborhood and tried to evenly distribute the parcels over the four-year period. So it was not for any reason other than just trying to stratify the neighborhoods and get an average number across the board. Some, some years I think we might have done, I'd have to look at the schedule, but some years we might have done three, some years we might have done four. You know, it, it was just a parcel count. Right. I guess I was just looking at this and I was just wondering, um, was there any reason that it was all designated to like certain districts and not coming into the city side at all? Or is it, I mean, like versus like picking a neighborhood from each district to get a good cohort of neighborhoods um, versus, you know, Old Mystic GLP kind of, you know, designated to one corner of town. And, and when we say neighborhood, Councilor Bordelon, we're not talking fire districts. No. We're talking geographical areas that we have determined to be a neighborhood that helps define the land value. You know, you hear the statement location, location, location. There are certain attributes that define a neighborhood for land valuation purposes. And so we have neighborhoods that the data is on the website, you can see it, the neighborhood number, but it does not relate to fire district. Right, that's not what I was stating. I was just wondering why none, none were picked in the city side and why that particular cohort that was you know, kind of set, not by fire district, but just by district in general, to one geographical location of the town and not a broad spectrum, because yeah. um, there was none picked for the city side. Is that correct? So the city has two residential neighborhoods, and I don't have the schedule in front of me, but they were mailed out hmm. sometime during the three years that my office was able to handle the processing. Mm -hmm. And they may have not been done together. They may have been on different schedules, I don't recall. Right. All right, um, I think that's what I have here in my notes. Um, and the other question, um, the database that's in house at the uh, town hall, some towns, depending on which forms of databases they choose to use, you can uh, um, access certain information from home without going into the town hall. Um, I appreciate all the help that you had given me on mine. I fell between the sale of a home and a uh, not getting some of that paperwork. So um, it would be helpful to make sure that in the future years that we have a way to catch the sales of um, homes, but also then resend the paperwork to the new homeowners. Um, and also, uh, I just think there should be a way that folks can access this data from home without having to go into the town hall, um, as other towns are able to do. Um, so especially in a huge, uh, tax eval season and, and a significant increase for folks that are, um, you know, on one hand, you're excited for the increase of the value of the property, but for some, it's the concern that now they're going to be paying more. 
and that could really uh, box certain people out of their home and um, having that availability to access that um, from home um, you know was a little bit um, tough especially during COVID so is there a way that we could have that database um, that's in the t uh, town hall you know able to be online so folks can get into it in a, in a much easier fashion so what um, Councillor Bordelon is talking about is our field card that's available online through the geographic information system, the GIS system, is an abbreviated field card because the way um, Tyler handles creating an individual field card, it actually is a program that recreates every field card every time <clears throat> you print it. We don't have this capacity or storage in our servers to be able to recreate a field card every time or put an entire PDF of field cards out on the website. Mm -hmm. So what we have done in-house <clears throat> is we have created an abbreviated property record card, which does give you property owner, mailing address, fire district, revaluation neighborhood for land value purposes, uh, data on the structure, um, square footage, sketch of the house, some limited information, bedrooms, bathrooms, kind of the stuff that's relevant. It gives you the full appraised value broken down by land building total, and it provides the full assessed value broken down by land building total. So most of the data is there, but not the entire property record card, which is what Council Bordelon was talking about. So yes, in future evaluations, we can see if we can handle it some, some other way. Um, I will say we've not had we've not had people breaking down the door trying to come in and get their field card, and we're happy to you know, get them a field card when we're able to. Uh, thanks. So I, I'll just um, I guess my question is to John: Is that a cost issue that other towns um, use other programs to access this data, and or just we have to go into the physical office? Is this something if it's a storage issue, or I mean I just think it's really important. Uh, to have the most accessibility as possible. Um, some of the other towns are using a different program, and I forget the name off the top of my head right now, um, but it just seems if we can do it, it should be something that we're striving to move towards. We could have finance uh, talk with IT and see where it would take. Uh, yeah. and, and if it's just a data issue, um, storage issue, it seems something like we should. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilor Kassir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Mary. Um, I just, my question is, COVID must have interfered with this process a little bit. Um, do you still feel that this was a fair and accurate revaluation process, even with COVID going on? Uh, I really do, because we have so much outreach in my office. Every time a property sells, we send a sales questionnaire, whether it's revaluation or not. And we're constantly validating our data. Every time our property goes on the market, we take a look at the real estate listing and we make sure that our data is correct. So we are always, always, every year updating our data. And even though we were not able to get into homes, um, we knocked on, you know, over six, six, 6,600 doors. Um, Maybe not knocked on over 6,600. Some of them were field checks. Some of them were no one was home, but we did site visit these properties. And I, I have always felt that Rotten is very lucky that we have the staff to maintain our data as well as we do. And that was one thing that I mentioned on the GMTV video. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I do think with the background of the work that we do in the office, that the data is still very good and very clean. And we also visit, you know, I don't know what the count is, maybe six or 700 building permits a year. So our, our, the assistant assessor is out in the field beginning in April after the Board of Assessment Appeals finishes and she's out until October. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I also think we have enough tools on our hands that um, our fingertips that we really do um, keep a, a good database. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Bumgarner. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you, Assessor Gardner, uh, for your work uh, during this um, very arduous process. As uh, Councilor Kassiri mentioned, I know uh, COVID um, placed a profound impact on your department and, and the revaluation process, um, but um, congratulations on wrapping it up in a very thorough manner, um, and also great job with that video on GMTV. Um, just two questions. Um, one, I know the unit used in the valuation of land in Groton uh, was the price of per acre. And just some research, I, I read that um, you know you can the unit used can be the price of acre per acre or the price per foot. Uh, I think another um, is uh, price per square foot. Uh, wh why is it that Groton utilizes the price per acre? Well, it, you know, your, your land value is structured by what your zoning calls for requirements. So if your zoning is um, a third of an acre for a building lot or an acre for building lot or two acres for building lot, you build your tables on what's required by zoning. And we use a price per acre uh, because it, it pretty much touches on all the different aspects. For waterfront, we use a linear price per square foot to add to the price per acre. Uh, a price, excuse me, yeah, price per acre. Um, it, it, it doesn't really matter, it, it's just math. Whether it's price per square foot or price per acre, we prefer price per acre. Thank you. Um, and my last question is, um, I saw that uh, vacant land, uh, there is a reduction in, in the uh, Per assessed value, um, I think on average about 8% for, for vacant land, um, but residential saw a, a pretty significant uptick, and, and I know we'll get into that later as, in, as it compares to commercial property. Um, but, you know, obviously land is, is valued uh, differently than the uh, building value or, you know, the value of the property that's built onto the land. And so the increase in uh, residential property, the uh, the um, the value of uh, residential property, was it attributable to the land, or or is it that folks were uh, simply you know renovating homes or um, you know making imp improvements uh, to their to their homes you know in the last five years? Um, obviously, you know the uh, home sales and it, it, big interest in. Uh, folks moving into the area, you know, is attributable to that. But I was just curious how kind of the, the land aspect played into the, the valuation of the, the residential side. Sure. So we did have some land sales, some vacant developable lot sales that helps for those neighborhoods to set the value. And we can, in certain neighborhoods, we can say that that's probably attributable to another neighborhood, maybe a neighborhood nearby. But when you have a um, new construction, uh, which we had up in the northwest corner of, northeast corner of the town, we had four or five new houses being constructed. We had land sales. That helps to define not only the price per acre, but um, when the property sells and you know what the land sold for, the difference is the value of the building. That pretty much um, helps you identify the cost approach to value. And we bracketed that by modeling using Marshall and Swift that Kevin mentioned. So we, we had enough information to tell us what the price of construction was. And I think anyone who has been looking around and thinking about adding a deck or adding a rec room in their basement pretty much knows that the cost of materials increased dramatically from 2020 to 2021. Um, that came out in the Marshall and Swift cost manual. So as appraisers, we have this data at our fingertips that we can apply to the methods that we use. And cost approach, comparable sales approach, income approach to value, we look at everything that's applicable to the property that we're appraising. So it's a combination of things, and I think Kevin touched a little bit on how we get to some of the 
um, appraised value for new construction and how we can apply that towards houses that are not new construction. Thank you. Councilor Jones? Uh, just a quick point. I, I found the answer to my question. It's actually in the agenda on page 50. So I'm good. Thank you. All right, I think it'd be a good time to have that second update. Are there any other questions, John? Not, not this time. Sure. Okay. So now I'd like to introduce John Valenti. Uh, John Valenti focused on the commercial industrial properties for Groton and what I wanted to say in advance of John picking up was that uh, under this project, so every commercial property was measured as part of this revaluation project. So we had a data collector out measuring every single commercial property and taking new photos because we needed to update our inventory. Um, he looked at the industrial and the exempt properties as well. And I will say that we, as typical, fee appraise electric boat and Pfizer as they're very uh, unique single purpose properties and they were not part of the Tyler technology project. So uh, I have some, some other notes, John, but I'm going to let you pick up from here if that's okay. And then if, if I think I want to add anything, I will at the end. So um, here's John Valenti. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, Council, for being here to listen to us tonight. Um, I have some experience in Groton as well. I don't go back as far as Kevin does, uh, but I go back to 2006 and experiencing working in Groton on commercial valuation back then. Uh, it's a wonderful community. You have a really varied group of, ty of different types of commercial properties. Uh, you've got the waterfront, you've got marinas, you've got uh, some hotel space office space, and you have a large number of apartments uh, in terms of valuation. Um, and it leads to some complexity. And in order to do valuation of commercial properties, we add another approach to it. Kevin talked about the cost approach using Marshall Swift tables. We do that too. And we look at sales data as well, as Kevin did. We have a third approach called the income capitalization approach which is what investors often do when they buy commercial industrial properties. They look at the gross income, they calculate out what the expenses are going to be, and then they come up with a net income, and then take that number and kind of calculate in their minds what they'd like to pay for that property, what kind of rate of return they'd like to have on that property. So that technique was used throughout the reassessment in Groton. And in order to do that, we gathered all kinds of income and expense data from Mary sending out some forms, income and expense request forms. We had a fairly good response back. And we took that data to create models, valuation models for the income approach. We kind of found out what rent rates are for a one bedroom, a two bedroom, a three bedroom. We looked at expense ratios for apartment buildings. The same thing is true for industrial space, for hotel space. All that data was gathered to arrive at a model. To, uh, to arrive at a valuation model for the income approach. The same thing that was done that Kevin talked about with the cost approach, we also developed that uh, for the, the commercial properties as well. And unlike Kevin's approach or the residential approach to look within the community, we also went beyond Groton to look for sales of properties because many of these properties compete not just within Groton, they compete with each other throughout the county. So we looked at all the sales data available to us in the London County. And one of the first things we did was look at appreciation, to see what the market was doing in New London County, as well as in Groton. And we saw an appreciation rate going on in Groton, as well as New London County, particularly for apartment properties, and to some extent, commercials and industrials, but greater increases going on with apartments. And that certainly reflects itself in the impact report that, that you folks have been provided. So apartments really went up between 37 and 61 percent. However, on the other flip side of that, hotels went down. And it's probably of no great surprise to you, COVID had a tremendous impact upon this reassessment as it affected commercial properties more so than it did on residential properties. 
So hotels went down, auto properties went up, offices remained about the same, retail properties about the same, some of them went down due to COVID. And we certainly reflected that when we did the valuation of the commercial properties. Throughout the entire process of the reassessment, I worked closely with Mary. Uh, she went out in the field with me. We looked at various neighborhoods and looked at different types of properties together. She flew me in on some factors about the town I wasn't aware of. We looked at traffic count to, uh, to adjust for different types of factors affecting value on properties. We also do statistical testing that Kevin spoke of as well. We did something called a pretest, which is to find out where the assessments were before we actually went out and valued them. And we found out that the assessments for the commercial properties in Groton were about 20% lower than market value. Significantly though, we found that the dispersion rate around the average increase or decrease in market value was all over the place. It was really varied, and that's what really needs to be adjusted. That's one great reason for having a reassessment to make things equitable and less dispersed. At the end of the project, we also did a post-testing to see how our rates were in relation to the selling prices and the income modeling, and things worked out well. The ratios came out within the range of IAAO testing, which is the standard that we adhere to, and we followed the state testing as well, and we adhered to those standards and passed on those as well. In terms of the grand list, you know, someone asked earlier about the percentage of the grand list and where do commercial properties fall in relation to residentials. The commercial properties really total only about 1,500 properties, which includes the exempt properties. Of those, about 900 of those are taxable. So it's a small number of properties, but they make up a, a large portion of your grand list. And they make up about 30%, and it seems to be that that's really where they are today and where they were last time. They were about 29% today, and before they were about 30% of the grand list uh, in 2020. So they've gone down just a little bit. So that's where the commercials are in relation to the residentials in terms of proportion. That's about it for me in terms of what we did. Uh, we had hearings as well. Uh, we had also, had, just like Kevin, we had a small turnout at the hearings. We only had about 60 or 70 people come to the hearings out of the 900 or so properties that we had appeal. And so I'm open for any questions you might have at this point about how we developed the valuation here for the commercial properties. Thank you for that update. Councilor Bordelon. Um, thank you so much. Um, when you talk about the decrease, and I looked at the top 10 um, companies that you know made the top 10 here, um, it would be helpful to have um, last year's net assessment next to it so we can see, um, you know, as, as a quick reference, you know, to see, okay, 2021 or whatever, and then the, the previous year next to it. But with that, where do you think our decrease is falling? Where do we stand with Pfizer and Electric Boat in compared to our last year's assessment? My question is, with Electric Boat building more on the waterfront, I thought we would see a, um, a possible even a uh, little bit more increase. So I was just curious as to where the drivers are coming from the decrease besides the hotel, but mainly looking at our top 10 um, people that were identified here on page 50. Um, you know, where are we at numbers and compared to last year? Are you want to respond to that, Mary? Yes, I had to unmute myself. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. And Councilor Bordelon, um, we could certainly put last year's assessments in the top 10, but you have to understand that some companies don't make the top 10 every year. It, it shifts around. So sometimes you won't have an assessment for a prior year. But Electric Boat and Pfizer were not part of Tyler Technologies project. And they were a fee appraisal by a, a company called Federal Appraisal LLC. And um, Pfizer's assessment increased. Electric Boat's assessment increased uh, for various reasons. And there's more than one property that we're talking about for real estate. Um, but overall, both overall assessments increased for both companies. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, 
I can understand if they do float around. I just think it would be, even if another company does the data, just with all of them as you break it down into districts, just to really have where they were assessed. And if there was no assessment, just put, you know, new company, no assessment. It just, um, as we turn over very frequently as a council of only two years, um, it, it, there's a lot of research as we go through these packets and time and effort we put in as well. It just would be helpful to have uh, quick references to see. Um, so when you stated the decrease, um, where are we seeing the decrease coming from? Is that the hotels? I think on page, um, page 61 of your packet is a summary of the commercial industrial properties. And the decrease was in hotels, motels, and a very minor decrease in shopping centers. Uh, restaurants had a 0% average of change. And offices in industrial had very slight increases, and apartments, as John said, increased quite a bit. And then there's a big group of others that just kind of don't fit into any of those major categories, and they were up overall about 20%. My, my last question is, um, when I looked at, I was doing some research when going through this, uh, looking at other assessments, um, some are even breaking it down for like each company, how many buildings are, 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 are wrapped into that cohort. Because it also gives the council the ability to track positive growth in the town. For example, if a, if a company demolishes a building or adds a building or you know enhances something. So we see an increase, but has there been any decrease in, um, in, in the top 10 of buildings that we were assessing, because the assessment might go up based on the number, but um, is it going up because of growth, meaning buildings, or or just the number that we're assessing at? And I guess that's another good scope to look at, because we look at our drivers in our town, and we want to see growth over time. And if you start to see folks getting rid of buildings or adding, it, it's, it's just another way to really look at the whole pie here. So I was just curious, are we seeing any growth in um, any of these top 10 drivers and um, um, building any new buildings, infrastructures? Are we seeing any, any coming down? What are, what are we seeing as far as that goes? I, I would have to say in this top 10 list, I have not seen any new buildings other than electric boat South York assembly building. Okay. And if you're looking at commercial growth, most of what I can think of as strong commercial growth has been downtown Mystic, but not really so much anywhere else in town. I, I, there's a new apartment complex on Pleasant Valley Road North. The apartments on South Road added a building a few years back. Uh, there are new apartments, condos at 10 Fort Hill Road. I know, you know, the barn, the hemp barn was renovated, but there's, there's, for the top 10, there's not been a lot of movement other than mm -hmm. South Yard Assembly Building. Gotcha. And is it possible, um, again, looking at these and looking at other assessments, because I just was like looking at other towns' assessment, adding a, another page that would state um, how many buildings we lost in these in these areas and how many we gained, um, um, and just new growth and as well as um, tax assessment that we lost on other commercial buildings, uh, maybe. Uh, knocked down or they revamped and built you know consolidated two buildings that were being assessed differently and then created one but just another page to kind of really give us a track of what's what's going up and what's coming down yeah i can consider that for future narratives thank you uh, i can tell you i don't think there have been any buildings knocked down that have not been replaced by brand new building in the last year or two thank you Does Councilor McBride have a hand? I can't see him. No hands up. All right. Um, all right. Well, I'm seeing no other hands, so I want to thank um, Director Landry, the Assessor Mary Gardner, um, and, and Kevin Rake and John Valenti for giving us our update. May I just add one thing, Mayor? Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Was that enough? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I did just want to say that Kevin Ray touched on the importance
informal hearings and overall there were 637 properties that held informal hearings with Mr. Valenti and other staff at Tyler. We've just received all of our board of assessment appeal applications and we are looking to have less than 300 appeals to the board, which again is surprisingly low. Um, I want to mention that the revaluation project passed the state testing standards and when we certified the grant list on January 28th, uh, it is in your packet on page 63. Thank you very much. I All appreciate right. your time tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, John. Okay, moving on to 2020-16-3, tax abatement program for surviving spouses, spouses of a fallen police officer or firefighter. Mr. Burt, you have an update for us? Sure, I'll go through the background real quick. Um, Connecticut legislature adopted PA 2000-215 in 2000. This allows municipalities to adopt by ordinance a program for abating property taxes for the surviving spouse of fallen firefighters and police officers who die during the line of duty. Um, the legislative body of any municipality may establish again by ordinance um, a program to abate all or a portion of the uh, property taxes. And we're only talking about the town's taxes, not other taxing entities' taxes. Um, with respect to real property owned and occupied as the principal residence of the surviving spouse of a police officer or firefighter who uh, dies while in the performance of such officer or firefighter's duties. Um, the town received a request previously, um, we looked at this last year, I'll go into that in a second, from Mrs. Fran Snyder, um, widow of William Snyder Sr., a uh, city of Groton police officer who did, who was, uh, who did um, die in the line of duty. Um, she was asked to have a, us adopt an ordinance as referenced above. She formerly lived in the city of Groton. City of Groton does have such ordinance, um, so she received that tax benefit there. Um, moved to another location in the town outside of city limits, so lost that, looking for the town to do that. We last, the council last discussed this February 9th of 21, um, where it failed to garner enough support to advance. Um, she's requested us to look at it again. It was on our last agenda and got postponed. The uh, draft ordinance you see in the packet on page 69, this is the same one we had looked at last year after some tweaks, so just continuing on what we had looked at because no other changes have been um, beyond this have been suggested. Basically just lays out the definitions of firefighter duties, police officer, uh, firefighter, that type of regular things. Um, Let's see, uh, this we had, had it tentatively set last time when we looked at a 50% abatement rather than 100%, but again, it's wide open to the council. It, it was just this ordinance was drafted at 50%. Um, it remains in effect so long as the surviving spouse owns the property as of October 1st of the grand list, uh, October 1st grand list, and occupies the residence as his or her primary residence or until the spouse conveys their interest uh, in the uh, residence. Let's see, uh, upon the uh, death of any person entitled to the tax relief, uh, the tax uh, shall end following the following June 30th. Let's see, um, continue to drop down a little bit. If such spouse, and going to G, if such surviving spouse remarries, the abatement shall cease commencing with taxes on the October 1st grand list, next following the date of such uh, remarriage. In the event that such remarriage shall terminate, such surviving spouse may apply for the abatement um, commencing with the following October 1st. Let's see, the surviving spouse's income, uh, annual income may not be more than 400% of the federal poverty level for a single person, family, household, as published annually and annually in January in the Federal Register by uh, the Department of Health and Human Services for the 48 contiguous states, and that is, uh, let me just double check, that's not, that's something we have put in this that's not per the state statute. Um, so that's something that could be adjusted, but I, uh, last I saw the single, uh, for single um, person, the poverty line was at 12,880, meaning at 400%, you'd be looking at 51,520. Let's see. Um, That's really the uh, highlights of it, and we do have our, I believe we still have our assessor and uh, finance director online too, if there's any technical questions. 
And, and again, oh, Ms. I forget if I mentioned, Mrs. Snyder is with us on remotely. If there's any questions for her. Okay, Councilor Bumgarner. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Manager Burke, for uh, the synopsis on uh, the history of uh, the legislation and uh, the local ordinances, um, or at least the one in, in the city. Um, quick question. Um, now, I understand with this city abatement, um, that was a 100%. I believe so. Um, reduction in, in taxes. Was that on just the uh, on the city mill rate or yes it can only be on the that taxing taxing jurisdiction they have for instance if you were to, let's say you're in Pocahontas Bridge fire now we'd have to have an ordinance for the for our taxes the fire district would have to have an ordinance for their taxes okay they, uh, they would be required to if we uh, they're not required to no they'd have to opt to okay hmm. um, and then just to follow up with that I, I had a very nice conversation with um, uh, Ms. Schneider, uh, Mrs. Schneider, over the weekend, um, to you know get a better understanding of uh, some of the history of, of the legislation, as it as she was uh, an integral part of getting the enable enabling legislation passed at, in, at the state level, um, and obviously, you know the hardship that she has gone through, the personal hardship, is, is something that. Um, I, I certainly can't imagine. Um, now, as I understand it, the tax abatement would be for uh, surviving spouses of fallen police officers and firefighters who obviously died in the line of duty. Um, this is very different from folks who, um, you know, say if you're a firefighter, you, you've had complications with, um, you know, you, you've been um, after years of duty, maybe having an illness relating to, um, you know, the, the line of work you did. Uh, th this isn't the case. This is These are folks who are dying while in uniform. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly personally would be supportive of this ordinance um, as to, you know, whether we're talking about a 50% or a 50% reduction in taxes or 100%. I think ultimately that, that's up to the council as conversations proceed. But... Uh, very much supportive of, of the concept of uh, moving it forward and, and uh, having an ordinance on the books. Um, uh, as I understand it, Ms. Schneider lived in the city and has since moved to Mystic and um, you know would not be entitled to that same um, abatement that she would have had in the city. So um, very much support having such an ordinance in the town and um, you know thank Ms. Schneider for Mr. Schneider for bringing this up uh, before us uh, again this year for consideration. Thank you. Mr. Burke. I'd like to add one other thing that's not in this ordinance, but it's in the act itself. Uh, this was discussed, I don't remember, it was last year. I think we even looked at it the year before. But um, besides spouse of police officer or firefighter, you can also do emergency medical technician. We had to include that in earlier versions, but I just want to make sure you're aware that that's an option. Yes, and, and I would um, be supportive of, of including that as well. Thank you. Councilor Kassirin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I may, I just wanted to disclose before we had even started this conversation, but I didn't jump in uh, quick enough, um, that I am a former police officer. I just wanted to disclose that to um, members of the public who may not have known that. I am also the spouse of a current police officer. Um, however, this would not benefit me as he is not a um, employee of the town, the city, or GLP. I just wanted to disclose that. Thank you. Councilor Franco. So I recall this being brought up last time in the full discussion that we had, and um, there were many reasons, I believe, many unanswered questions as to why we didn't move forward. Um, we, there had been other items brought up about what about, would we do this for Gold Star military families? What about town staff who might die in the line of duty if it was public works and they were out on the road and got hit by a car and potentially passed away? Um, would they have to be Groton employees versus if they were um, police officers outside of our jurisdiction of Groton, but maybe moved here in the future? Um, 
what are the, um, we had discussed also some things that were brought up or benefits if um, they die in the line of duty, they have additional increased benefits as well. Um, and just saying some things that were discussed at that meeting, um, are we creating an ordinance for just one person? Would it abatement um, percentage, I mean, the city was probably a couple of hundred of dollars probably in a city um, fire district fee compared to the thousands of dollars that are in the town's real estate property tax. Um, and would the fire districts, are they interested in doing this and have they said anything? And if we did put this into play, would it apply to Groton Long Point in the city? Um, or would they have to be interested and sign off on it as well? Um, that's, I, I believe there were so many questions without real answers at that time last year as to why we just didn't move forward on this. I can address okay. a couple of things. <laughs> Manager Burr. Let, let me just, yeah. Um, in terms of town staff or others, not through this act, that would have to, we, there has to be a mechanism in law to allow for it, so um, Mary would have to answer if there's anything out there, but it would not be associated with this. Um, out, right now, we set it for people, the department had to be within the town, and it can be whatever you want. However, to limit it, um, not have people, you, you know, a lot of people move in because of it, um, it's set to, you have to be within a valid um, organization in the town. Um, town tax, that's wherever we collect, and that applies everywhere in the town. Wherever the town tax is, it has nothing to do with the city themselves or GLP. If there's a town tax, we're waiving it if it happens to be there. On the property tax. Right. And then it was, it was, by the way, brought up it, um, to her fire district where she's at. Um, my understanding is they declined to move forward with anything last year. So it the was fire district said no to it. Right. Uh, right. And what, um, so if there was anything to do with military or Gold Star? Not through this act. Right, that would be something, something else, would have to another be additional. Because mm -hmm. um, I believe that was sort of where the conversation was going. If we were to do something of this, was there other people that we would want to create an ordinance? Excuse me, to cover? one second. I don't know if you could hear me. Um, I'm I sorry. I want to submit the bill. And any questions that you have, I can verify them. This bill was submitted in 2000, approximately about 2000, 2001. So anyone after the fact, whether they're military, they can submit them the, a separate bill of their own. This was only pertaining to police and firemen line of duty who were killed in the line of duty which is a bill that has been in other New England states for many years. Thank you. Councilor Franco, you have the floor. I'm all set, thank you. Councilor Bordelon. Um, thank you. Um, I think it's really important to um, definitely you know, represent uh, you know, a community of, of people who, um, you know, are subject to you know this type of tragedy, and uh, you know I do think um, if we do set something and it states per the town, then how would that um, support? Because her husband was a fallen officer of the city. They mean literally. We put it as in within the uh, geographic boundaries of the town. Any one of the agencies, GLP, whether it's uh, fire or you know any one of the fire agencies, any one of the police agencies, right. if it was located within the town, right. Um, and then you said that we can and, and also add emergency personnel. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen stuff also where you know it's you know you know people also you know line of duty you know they could be working for Department of Corrections um, you know the line of defense. This bill does not cover them. It does not. Right. Um, I mean, it's really tough. I think it's, you know, it's hard because there was one already set in the city and now it moves to the town. And I mean, everyone has the right to move. Um, but at what point, I guess, some of the questions that had come up were, you know, do you, you know, then the next person might want to enact something when they move in or, you know, um, so it's kind of, uh, it's a bit tough. I mean, I don't think it's something that 
is unmanageable. Um, I'm a little curious, and I wish we had the fire department here to talk why they, uh, do we have anything about that, John? No, it's been a year since that was yeah. discussed. There, did they send them a letter or anything stating why they? I'd have to look, it's been right. too long. So without that information, it's kind of hard for me to determine. So with that, I feel like I couldn't vote on that tonight. I'm just a little curious as to why the fire district, and I would think that we should invite them um, as well. If we're, if we're setting an ordinance to protect the fire uh, and EMS and police officers, and yet they're rejecting it. So I'm just a little confused. I would think that they would be in support of it. So, Excuse um, me once. Um, so I, I feel uh, there could be some more information there that should be uh, maybe, um, I mean, I think this is something that we should really look at. I also think it should be gender neutral. I think define spouse um, in this day and age, you know, moving forward, if someone else became a fallen officer or, or a fire, if we were to pass this, it needs to be uh, gender neutral to make sure that we are including, um, you know, every uh, possibility or combinations that folks may identify as, John. Um, so would this cover them under that? You could put just the, you know, the general day and that type of thing. But just I'm to sorry? mention the we could you know, they or whatever we want to use. Uh, mentioning the surviving spouse, we did look into the legalities of that, and this definition is what we pretty much have to use for the surviving for the spouse. Um, it's and restricted it's, you know, and it, by looking at other statutes. Right, and is that recognized by the state? I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, some state jobs still do not recognize, recognize unfortunately, in this day and age, um, you know, the same gender marriages or um so would this by the state protect someone who was in yeah, um, married you're married right it, I, have we looked into I that yet a lot of the yeah. questions have we, have we looked into I that yes we have. we have i and, apologize and that would be covered yes um okay because that's really important to me because you know when this was established a lot's changed and i just want to make sure all the community is represented properly um and what are we looking for as far as like a number, um, as far as the taxes that would be abated? It would be property tax? Just, just property, that's all it applies to is our, the town property tax. Real that, property, not personal property or anything like that. Okay. Um, that's all I have for right now for questions. Okay. I'm gonna make a motion right now. I make a motion to adopt an ordinance abating 100% of the property taxes for the surviving spouses of fallen firefighters, police officers, or emergency medical technicians pursuant to PA 2000-215, Section 10. So moved. Second, Baumgartner. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Baumgartner. Just uh, if Burr. it did go through, I assume I would have the ability to update the definitions to include that, you know, to make any necessary changes. Thank you. Well, Council Borlon? Um, some of the other ordinances I saw, the towns did 50 or 75 percent. Um, so there's nothing precluding us from, like, nothing preventing us from making it. I mean, I think a break of any kind is great. It, it, there's nothing stating for the state statute that I read that said that we couldn't do 50 percent or 75 percent, correct? Correct. It's any percent that town council would right. like. It's at right now at 50 percent. I mean, right now we're looking at, you know, we, we, there's nobody else, and this is being moved from the city to the town. Um, I'd like to amend the motion on the floor. For consideration i'm full support of it i so again still think tonight if we're going to move and a motion was already put on the floor i don't think there's an extreme rush this is not a pressured thing that's something that we couldn't next week or next month look at but if tonight it seems that counselors want to move on it this fast i i, I could support um amending as written 50 percent um it is at 50 percent right now i thought you said 100 percent. no he just made a motion for 100 percent oh he's oh sorry okay i thought you meant what's in here sorry i missed that no no uh, am I wrong or? No, you're correct. Yeah. Okay. So my amended motion would be to 50%. Um, and I just also second. think. Second. Moved by Borlon, seconded by Franco to amend the original motion from 100% to 50%. Council Borlon. Thank you. I still think that that gives a break. I think we have to keep things in perspective. Um, I mean, it, you know. It could always be reamended at a later date if, if the council so chose. I think the fact that the police department, uh, the fire department did not seem like it was a great idea and we do not have them here. I also think it's important to have that presentation and discussion. Um, I do think the 50% does meet a need. Um, and the city's was at what percent? 
hundred percent. They did a hundred percent, right? In a smaller municipality. Okay. Um, so I'd be supporting the fifty percent. I think it 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 identifies it in the in the city at the town of Rotten. It sounds like the city has a hundred percent, and you know we um, are moving in that direction. I think something is um, definitely important, and this would definitely uh, represent that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Frank. Excuse Franklin. me. One, I just want to clarify one thing. Yes, and I Ms. apologize Rana. for interrupting. Since I was a Connecticut rep for many years of concerns of police of virus, I worked closely with Henry Kidd, Kidd and Tom Curcio. They were totally on board with this at the time. So I worked with them as well whenever they've had to do something as far as any um, uh, medical damage on line of duty. Thank you. So it wasn't just police. I was very extremely active. And as I explained to other people when I submitted it up in Hartford, they wanted to put a lot of other things on it. And I said no. So when it came about, the wordage was slightly changed. Thank you. Councilor Franco? Is Ms. Landry so on the much. line? Thank you. She is. Cindy? Cindy, are you there? And, and just to mention, uh, Councilor McBride does have his hand up. I am here. I'm sorry. Thank you. Can you tell me what do um, disabled vets get as a percentage off of their personal property tax? Um, I believe um, I don't have all the paperwork in me, but I think it's a disabled vets thousand dollars. I'm there sorry. How much? There are different phases of that. There are different levels depending on the disability. I'm sorry. I think Mary um, has left the call. But it's, you would think it's about $1,000 a year for probably 100% disabled? Off of the assessment, yes. Reduction off of the, the assessment. assessment. It's not taxes. Not taxes, off of the assessment. Right. It's off of the assessment. Um. So do you know what that would equate to potentially for somebody with maybe a $250,000 house, something of that nature? Well, $1,000 would be it's $2598 per $1,000. Is that just disabled or is that normal veterans? Because I know my late husband- There are two. There are disabled and veterans. There's a totally disabled and then there's the veterans exemption. So line of duty would be considered totally disabled? Sorry, not necessarily. No, there are other guidelines as far as the um, totally disabled and the veteran. You have to have to be during a specific war time to be eligible for those benefits. Yeah. I mean, as far as a death goes. So, Cindy. Yeah. I'm sorry. So what would you say approximate savings to a 100% disabled veteran would receive in Groton on their taxes per year? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have that. I, I, don't, I can't answer the question. I'm sorry. I don't have it. I'm trying to see if I can bring it up. Um, I don't have that information right in front of me. Well, I'm just asking this question because there's, there are residents that are in our community as well that have given a lot to our, our country and have become totally disabled. And I think if their, their family, you know, if we're going to give something, we should give it maybe some kind of equality. Um, between the, the differences. And I would like to wait until I got that kind of information. And I'm sorry I didn't ask for it in advance. Thank you. Mr. And I'm sorry that I did not get to bring that with me. No, I, I didn't. Apologize. I didn't expect you to bring it and being able to read my mind. So, but sorry. Mr. Burr. I just wanted to mention a holdover of uh, the October 1st, 21 should be 22 for moving forward. So just to mention that on the bottom of six, page 69. Okay, thank you. Councilor Kasiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was also going to recommend um, that we add the verbiage of 
after Town of Groton in the police officer paragraph to actually state Town of Groton Police Department, City of Groton Police Department, and Groton Long Point Police Department, so it's clear. Um, since Officer Snyder's passing, including Officer Snyder, um, 20 officers have died in the line of duty in the state of Connecticut in the past 28 years, um, which, is, which equates to 0.714 deaths um, per year. And there has been one line of duty death um, in Groton for fire, which was in the city of Groton in the year 2000. In regards to the comments about why we should give abatements to only law enforcement families today, um, there is a reason why there is specific legislation for law enforcement spouses, and that is because the entire lifespan of a law enforcement career is a sacrifice on the police officer, but also his or her entire family. I don't view this as a compensation of a single sacrifice. It's a compensation for a family's constant and consistent sacrifice. Over the course of a career in law enforcement, a police officer collectively builds up trauma, and there are studies that indicate that the spouse or families of officers therefore can suffer secondary traumas from the officer due to the line of work that one does in law enforcement. The law enforcement family lifestyle is not an easy one. It, it is a career's worth of unpredictable schedules, unforeseen long hours, shift changes, critical incidents that occur a minute before your shift is about to end, causing you to have to work to up to 20 hours, and call outs. This is not an easy lifestyle for children, especially young children who do not, who do not understand why mom or dad has to miss birthdays, Christmas mornings, baseball games, or why they can't be there to put them to sleep. Statistically, it is very rare to be killed in the line of duty, so when a law enforcement family lives this life besides their loved one who is an officer, they expect that at the end of their 25-year career, they will have their loved one on the other side of this career to move on from a life of trauma and unpredictable schedules. What we don't account for is the physical and emotional toll it takes on officers every day, thus the family takes on every day. Imagine if all of a sudden that person was gone, and now the family doesn't even have the loved one on the other side of the sacrifices they have made for the span of a career. This ordinance will only benefit Town of Groton, City of Groton, and GLP officers who are killed in the line of duty. Therefore, these are literally the officers who are serving our community, who have patrolled our streets every day, and who have made the ultimate sacrifice. We cannot make decisions on topics in fear that if we grant a tax abatement for one group of people, this could allow for others to ask. That is not our task today. Our task is to ask ourselves if this proposed ordinance is fair for the spouses of officers from our own community who suffered a line of duty death. We are looking at an ordinance for an already well-researched and thought out public act inspired of um, by all the other states around us who already have these protections in place. Our agenda item tonight is for police and fire spouses. If we believe that police and fire spouses should have this abatement, then we should grant the abatement tonight. This ordinance is fair. It has protections allowing from someone who has an income of over 400% of the federal poverty level, and then that spouse has to apply yearly to, approve, um, to prove their income and to make sure that they have not remarried. There are municipalities that offer tax abatements to officers who live in their community to incentivize officers to reside in the communities that they police. This is only compensating the families for the loss of an officer who died serving our community. I think that this ordinance is the least that we can do. In regards to the sentiments that this ordinance would only benefit one individual in our community, yes. Right now, this ordinance would benefit one resident of Groton who lost her spouse in the line of duty. I hope it only ever benefits this one resident. However, if there is ever another resident, the spouse of one of our officers, to lose their life serving our community, I hope that this, will, this ordinance will be in place to help that family with their insurmountable loss. I will vote yes tonight for 100% tax abatement for our families. Thank you. Thank you. Just, Mr. Burt, I have a clear, um, regarding Councilor Gasiri's amendment mm -hmm. to specify Town of Groton. Is it in the PA 2002-15, does it specify that it has to be in the town where they reside? Or it can be set to whatever the, uh, whatever the municipality wants. Okay, so we need to make that clarification. Well, it's already set to the boundary. It's just, make, she's making sure it's, you know, uh, pointed out part. 
the, okay. the language is kind of unclear, so mm. I just wanted to. Okay, all right. So, Councilor McBride. I, I apologize. My question was answered by Councilor Cassiari with regards to the, the long-term financial impact of this. I, I thought there would have been uh, greater financial impacts. So I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bumgardner. Yes, um, thank you. I, I'd like to align my remarks with uh, Councilor Kassiri and just um, incredibly well articulated and, um, you know, thank you for uh, your service as well. Um, now, with respect to uh, the ordinance before us, I, I know there have been some concerns tonight as to, um, and, and thank you, Councilor Franco, for uh, bringing up some of the questions that uh, came up when we previously discussed this last year. Um, you know, I, it, it's my understanding that we will be putting together a, a tax abatement or um, tax relief study group in the coming uh, months, and uh, perhaps you know, the task of that committee will be to look at some of the um, suggestions you had brought up, you know, where um, you know, we'll be uh, potentially looking at uh, tax relief for um, disabled veterans and um, so many other important um, constituency groups of uh, living within Groton. So um, very much supportive of obviously extending relief to um, some of the individuals uh, you um, had brought up as well, uh, Councilor Franco. But um, just again, um, this evening, we believe we should be moving forward with um, the ordinance before us for um, specifically um, uh, uh, fallen police officers and firefighters. Thank you. Mr. Burr. I just want to point out, uh, Councilor Parker has her hand up. Okay. Councilor Parker. Good evening. I just want to ask if all the councilors who are there in person can move their microphones closer because it's hard to hear. I can hear some, but not all. And, um, hi, Fran. Sorry, Councilor I'm Parker. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry I to be more emotional. I really appreciate I really appreciate, and you know, being a Phil's accident. And so I really appreciate what Council Cassidy said that I couldn't. So and thank you. I'm going to align my remarks with Councilor Cassidy. So I'm in full support of 100%. Um, as she stated, it takes a toll on the families and it takes a toll on all of us working in the department in, and all over it. I've been with the department almost 15 years. I wasn't there for Officer Snyder, but um, in talking with other police departments, it takes a toll not only on the family, it takes a toll on the personnel. So if there's any way we can support the families at all, yes, I understand Council Franco brought up the veterans, but we are looking at line of duty death for police officers and firefighters, and we need to stay to the topic tonight. So we went off topic, and I didn't want to call anything out, but it's about this agenda item. The other agenda items that you brought up, other items you brought up are not germane to this topic tonight. So if we can stick to what we have here, it's only about the police officers and firefighters in the light of duty for the tax abatement. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will also align myself with uh, Councilor Gasseri's comments and we'll be supporting the 100%. Thank you. Councilor Franco. I'm just going to notate. of people that have struggled in our community, either by 100% disabled or line of death. And if you're going to give 100% to firefighters and to police and to EM EMTs, I mean, I, of course, my heart, of course I would want to do that. But if you start looking and you look at families like that have disabled veterans, 100% disabled veterans who are struggling, and there's no way you can give them 100% because the state won't allow you to give them 100%. What I'm saying is keep it somewhat equal. I mean, there are sacrifices 
There are emotional drainings on lots of families that have sacrificed a lot, and I'm trying to ask that you give it some time to look at the other options to see, like, I remember the conversation when it came to military, and we can't give that much. The state won't allow it. The state does allow it for police and fire, but I think as a Groton community, maybe we should come up with something as a whole and look at it as a bigger picture item and not just a one-off on just the police and fire and EMT, but we should look at other items as well. Thank you. Councilor Parker, did you have a hand? I was just gonna say, since it is state statute, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for letting me speak. Um, that may be something we need to talk to our legislators about to see about doing something and getting involved that way with regards to military. We have several people who, who do things, Congressman Courtney, we have a senator, we have state reps. If we need to go that route, then we need to go that route. But tonight's issue is what we have on the agenda item. So. I'm just trying to point out that we need to stick to what the agenda item is. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Borlon. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Councilor Cassieri's remarks, um, and uh, I understand uh, Councilor Franco's concerns. Um, once again, I am full support, obviously, and thought 50% because you know, I saw other towns that didn't do the full 100%. I can respect you know, the EMT, fire, police, but I can align my remarks too with Councillor Franco in the sense looking at the military and maybe it is a bigger issue to look at as a whole town, as well as looking at the Department of Defense correction officers, just as uh, uh, Councillor Cassieri stated, um, you know, they are with, uh, in building blocks all day and uh, their death rates are extremely high and they may not live in the town that they serve, but they serve their town by working with the incarcerated individuals that uh, our police department uh, you know, work collaboratively with them. So there might be a move in the future to look at uh, Department of Defense, military, um, and I think there is a need to serve that community as well. Thank you. All right, I'm seeing no other hands, so I'm gonna call for a vote. The first we're gonna vote on is the amended motion of 50%. So all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 Councilor McBride? Opposed. Opposed. Abstaining? Abstain. Okay. So that fails. One in favor, Bordelon? Seven opposed. And one abstaining, Franco. Councilor Kassiri? Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to make an amendment to your original motion so we can fix that language. Okay. okay. I will make a motion to adopt the draft ordinance beginning on page 69 of our packet and ending on page 71 of our packet, changing any of the October 1st, 2021 dates to October 1st, 2022, and adding after Town of Groton on page 69 in the police officer section. Um, I'd like to add Town of Groton Police Department, City of Groton Police Department, and Groton Long Point Police Department after the Town of Groton. Second, Bumgarner. Moved by Kasiri, seconded by Bumgarner. I'm sorry, and it needs to be 100% in that as well. 100%. Do you still wish to second? Yes. All right. Moved by Kasiri, seconded by Bumgarner. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll call for a vote. And this again, this is for 100%. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Councilor McBride, was that in favor? That was in favor. Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. So that carries eight in favor, zero opposed, one abstaining, Franco. Thank you, Mrs. Schneider, for, for being here. Well, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Groton Town Councilors. I really appreciate it. All right, we're now on to 2022 9 2 Town, Council, Town Attorney Selection. It can be found on page 72. 
Would you like me to read the motion? Sure. Okay. Make a motion to recommend a resolution appointing Eileen Duggan of the firm of Sussman, Shapiro, Wool, Brennan, Gray, and Greenberg, PC, as town attorney. I so move. Second, Jones. <coughs> So moved by Parker, seconded by Jones. And John Burt, can you give some background? Sure, be glad to. Um, as you recall, the town council did decide to put this uh, RFP out to bid. Um, our purchasing agent, Eileen Cardillo, put it out for 21 days. She posted it to typical places with on our website, of course, on um, the state's bid list. And it, I sent it to uh, several firms that the town's dealt with in the past, too, just to try to get it out there further. Um, the panel, which uh, I don't, it's in your packet. I don't think I need to read who all was on it, but there was eight individuals who first, uh, the bids were received, five bids were received by purchasing. Um, they were presented to the panel. Um, three of the five bids were found unanimously by the panel to not be in compliance with the bid package, leaving two to be interviewed. Um, the town, the uh, panel then held subsequently held the interview with the two, which is available online to view. Um, and we included all the questions you saw on the video, anyways. But we included in this packet everybody's question sheet, what they wrote down from it, all the scoring sheets, etc. So once the interview was over, uh, the purchasing agent gave the uh, direction to the um, to the panel to you take both the bid package you received as well as the interview into consideration when you do these scores. Um, and there was quite a bit of difference in the scores between the, uh, the two um, uh, remaining bidders in the process. Um, and it was unanim unanimous by the panel to recommend that Sussman Shapiro be reappointed. And uh, I second that pers personally. I think they do a fantastic job. And uh, uh, they were head and shoulders above anyone else in the process. Thank you. Councilor Westerville. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Is this on? Yeah, it's yes. Okay. Um, I believe, maybe I, maybe I misunderstood how the RFP process was supposed to be run, but I anticipated that we were going to um, see more from all of the bidders. I didn't realize that the bid list was going to be cut um, down to uh, what was might have been considered reasonable by the panelists. Um, not having the actual information in front of us for exactly why uh, some were not um, allowed to move forward, I don't think that that is transparent. Um, I disagree with this and I object to the motion. I don't believe that we have enough information and I don't believe that the process was uh, followed through with properly. I also um, will myself go back and review uh, the different town council meetings where we talked about the RFP process because I believe in there it did show that we would be hearing from all of the bidders, not just those that some decide were um, acceptable and others that were not. Thank you. And I could mention uh, why the three were removed. And part of why they're not presented is the our, it's our standard uh, policy of the purchasing department to, for instance, at this point, it'd be put us in a potential legal jeopardy to consider them since they haven't been, they, you know, have seen the bids, they've seen the interviews, they weren't part of that. Um, so I don't know how you would consider them at this point. But uh, one of the vendors, uh, they only almost exclusively showed labor and employment experience. They didn't detail any of their other experience, um, as well as uh, not that this came into consideration, but they were uh, extremely high in price. Um, another one failed to, you have to list who's gonna be the primary, like Eileen is for Sussman. They did not, they did not uh, put that down. They did not include Appendix B, which is your uh, disbarment that you're not, no one is disbarred. You can practice law, that type of thing. They did not include that. Um, is, and this doesn't come into play here, but a very convoluted uh, fee structure. Um, and then the third was basically a, a very small shop. They only showed labor and employment um, um, as their experience, not the uh, full range of things. And if you remember from the original cow packet that is out of, 350,000 or so spent, the municipal part, which is a wide ranging thing, is only about 75, 80,000 out of the 350. It's actually uh, taxes, I think, are the, the highest usage of the time. 
Councillor Baumgartner. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when we deliberated on um, the RFP uh, process um, a few weeks ago, I brought up and uh, questioned the criteria we would be using to assess each applicant. And um, to piggyback of what, off of what Councillor Westervelt um, stated, I was shocked to see that obviously three of the five um, uh, were rejected. It, it's my understanding that at least two of them do provide uh, town attorney services or have to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, do provide town attorney services to other municipalities, uh, one of which uh, was disqualified, served as our bond council. So I was pretty shocking to me that they wouldn't properly uh, complete an RFP, uh, given that they were responsible for our com school construction uh, bonds. Um, so I, too, have a hard time uh, being able to uh, vote on an RFP process that I, I think, and again, this is no disrespect to the committee um, or the, you know, the folks who sat on the committee, um, but was somewhat flawed due to that very fact. Um, it is not indicative of my personal thoughts on, on um, our town attorneys. I, I think they are uh, more than capable um, of, you know, performing uh, the duties, um, and you know, especially many of the members of that uh, of their uh, law firm. But I, I do believe that uh, it was abundantly clear from the residents of Groton that have come uh, to several public hearings that they wanted a full and thorough process. And I, I just do not believe we uh, provided that opportunity to them. Um, and I did review the tapes. Obviously, we had interviews. Um, but to be left with two choices, as opposed to even four or, or the five that were submitted is, is a bit frustrating to me. So. I, I think it is difficult to, for us to vote to to, um, to grant an RFP um, when it was the, the the committee that had determined uh, few law firms were in, you know ineligible and we can't even see those RFPs um, because of the uh, purchasing agents policies. So. Um, I will leave it at that and. Uh, uh, nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Franco. Thank you. I will say about four years ago, Councilor Parker and I were on the council, the only two councilors still here from four years ago, and we went through this process, and I believe we only received a few responses as well. It was maybe five, if that. And it was when I said to you, it might be surprising what we receive, this is what I was referring to. You're going to get responses that aren't going to fit the needs of our community. Um, so this is indicative of what we saw four years ago. There's nothing basically much different than what happened four years ago. Um, so people may not like what they hear sometimes from our town attorneys. I mean, I don't always, so I get it. But they're telling us what's in the best advice of legal for, our, for us to follow. Um, there's also, like the RFP process, there's also purchasing laws and, and how you go about this. Um, you can't just open up the bids to every, for everybody to see while you're in the process. I mean, this is not the first time this has happened, and it's been explained to us on numerous occasions, like when there's bids on, you know, school buildings, the same thing happens. You just can't open all the bids up while you're in the process. You just, it's just how it, it works. Um, so I think this is basically indicative of what happened four years ago, and I think um, when, when people are saying there's not enough data or information, um, our packet this week, just for the people at home, is 389 pages, and the attorneys are going to take up 175 pages. 175 pages. By the way, it's double-sided. So, I mean, it's not like there was no data here to look through. There, there's people who did interviews with them, they wrote down descriptions, they wrote down their thoughts, everything's written down here. It's pretty well documented. Um, so with that, I will now 
yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I would just like really honored to be part of that panel. It was a very professionally run panel. We deliberated very carefully um, over a series of um, different different days. Um, the firms that were passed through, which we can't really talk about, but they were completely legitimate reasons and just didn't cut the mustard um, for why they weren't there. Um, the two firms, Sussman and Shapiro, and um, what's the other one? Holler and Sage. Holler, um, both gave um, presentations, which you can see in the video. You can go through. Um, questions were kept, were covered a, a wide breadth of um, different departments in the town. Um, they were very carefully thought out, and um, I think everybody, I think it was a very well-run process, a very professional-run process um, by all all members. I know in my in myself, we were uh, past, um, I think in the 12, 112, um, committee, we had a chart that broke down the expenses, so a lot of my judgment when I looked at this um, table that was in there was the, the bulk of the assessments, the bulk of the costs for assessments and labor were the two areas that um, uh, much of the law firm expenses were done. And just watching their responses from Sussman and Shapiro as they went through every one of those things, broke down every process, um, was almost like a little mini law course in how they did it and what they did. So I think uh, that firm should be proud in how they presented themselves. They came with a full team. Um, the other firm came with three people missing the two people that were essential for judging assessment and labor issues. Those people weren't even included in their mix that night. So it was very clear at the last, the final presentation and in the interviews of who shined in that meeting. Um, and I think I would commend all the different department heads in the town, um, but just doing a fantastic job. It was cordial, uh, great discussions, and um, I think the process was the correct one. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bordelon. Um, thank you. I guess I can align my remarks with some of the previous um, counselors on both ends. I, I, it's no personal judgment of anybody that's... I apologize. I guess I can align my remarks with um, all the counselors that have spoken, I mean, on some different form or format. It's no judgment. I just think it's good due diligence, transparency, and accountability to go out to RFP on a regular basis and check and see, as it was stated, Four years ago, some of us weren't here. I was at the end of that term, and uh, the, the, you know, they had already done the, the one year. But the very first year that I took my seat, I asked, we should go to RFP, and it was stated, no, we did this less than two years ago. I just think for the town, when you have people overwhelmingly speak and state that they'd like to see what else is out there, and they'd like to reconsider and um, look at different avenues, we have a job to make sure that we do such. That's just normal. It's not to sit here and say that any one person or one attorney or one section is you know, worse than the next. It's just due diligence. It's important when you have people handling your, your affairs to sometimes switch it up and have a new set of eyes. I too also felt extremely frustrated with the fact that it was narrowed down to two. I mean, some people in here, and it's all public knowledge, gave the current attorney 100%. That's their decision. I mean, I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but it's just really hard to navigate through this. I also was not, um, was not in agreement with the selection process. I thought that it should be at least two town councilors, one that has served at least for several years on the council, who has also been part of multiple executive sessions. That did not happen. Um, and then looking at the difference in the score, naturally, you know, our current attorney, you know, has a, a significantly higher score. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Baumgartner, which regards the bond uh, attorney. Um, the stuff that we were given, I, I kind of wish it was typed. I mean, some of this you can barely read. It's handwritten, um, and it was very hard to, to, to navigate through. Um, so it, it just seems to me that, um, we could do um, and dive in a little bit di deeper. The reasons in which I had concerns or what was brought to my attention were Merritt Property, Mystic Oral School, and, the, and, and, and so on and so forth. These are things where people felt that there were missing items that it costed us, the town, more money, and they felt that maybe there should have been something else that should have happened. 
I also felt that the other attorneys that we cannot see the RFP, we go to executive session for many items, and yet, as counselors who are managing money in the town and all the other deeds and things that we're privy to that we could not see the other RFP process in executive session, I had hoped that possibly there would have been a breakout session as such once it came down to the final uh, candidates that we would have been brought into an executive session of sorts, reviewed the items and the applications, and had a chance to kind of go through the process and see where we stood. So my first question, I guess, is to John. My understanding is that we can technically go out to RFP at any time if we wanted. If somebody down the road wanted to send this wet back out, we could. Um, According to the charter of what I read. Yeah, if you had enough votes, you certainly could. I'm sorry? Yeah, if there was enough votes, certainly you could. Right, so we can go back to RFP at any time. Right. So the council has the job to do that. Also in this, um, I was looked, I did some research at other towns. They had town staff on there, but they had more council representation. And they also added neutral players that are not part of the town that know, look at the runnings of a town and add them part of the process. Our process of the people who stood on here is one town council, you know, a bunch of people that our attorneys have to work with on a daily basis. That's kind of hard to, you know, tell them they're not the one. I know it'd be hard for me, like as a counselor who sits up here today, it's like, I mean, to, to process and vet that, I mean, you know, if, if one of the counselors had gave him a zero or a five, point of order. they were back on, One they second. are. What's your point of order? You're going to the motive of somebody's grading. Um, you can't speak for another counselor on their motives, on how they grade somebody, on whether they, how they would feel when they grade somebody. It's out of order. Okay, your point of order is well taken. Just stick to the sure. merits well, of I'm the speaking to the. Term. Thank you. I'm speaking to the items that are here and they're graded. So I'm speaking to the numbers, which is they wouldn't be given to me. It's not a motive. He has every right, or whoever has the right to give 100. It's all public knowledge on, online. But what I'm trying to say is, as a town official who works directly with the attorneys, it's kind of hard to judge, and, and, and it, it could be seen as being hard. I'll say that. So I just hope in the future, if we do go to RFP ever again, that we look at a different, broader spectrum or process where we're including people that aren't directly impacted by the decisions of the attorney of the town. That opens it up for a broader view, and it, and it allows for um, a much more transparent process. Um, again, as I stated, the, the type, I mean, I mean, hundreds of pages of stuff that's, you know, you can barely read. Um, it, 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 I mean, it should be typed or, or put into a program. I mean, I watched the meeting. Um, it's, I don't know, I just think we could have done a little bit better in the process. I think we should have come back to the council at the point where we eliminated three right off the top and allowed the council to weigh in in an earlier phase and that option was not given to us. So for that, I, I do have a lot of concerns with this process. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Burr. Uh, a few things. Uh, one, I just wanted to mention that it was mentioned about the mayor property. I've heard that other times. This wasn't this firm. That was uh, that was uh, our bond council with, uh, yeah, that was not them. So I've heard that it's nothing to do with these attorneys. Um, also to mention in terms of the question asked, you know, this is what the council picked for that panel. If you watch the video, they're very technical questions for the most part. Unless you're dealing with the attorneys and know what our needs are, I don't agree with having a wider audience. And this has become such a political football, and there's no denying it. I addressed some of the misinformation when I joined MOSA last night for their meeting. Um, if we change our typical procedure of not showing those who didn't make it through, I think it's a disservice to the entire town. It would look bad on us. I really do. Thank you. Councilor Westerville. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, with all due respect, this is not four years ago. This is now. The environment has changed. Um, there's a lot of distrust uh, from the constituents throughout the town. They were looking for a more open and transparent process. This, to me, doesn't doesn't make this, or this, to me, does not cut the mustard as a open and transparent process. And that's my. Uh, that's my take on this. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner? Yes, I, I would just like to clarify. I stated earlier that um, our bond council, uh, the, the firm was uh, had submitted an RFP, and that wasn't the case. It was a, a member of, a, of a, the, the different firm. Yes, yeah, so right. now um, a, a member of the a law firm that submitted an RFP. Right. So 
Um, but with that said, you know, obviously here uh, the discussion this evening, um, as Councilor Bordelon mentioned, um, Manager Burt, would it be what, what would the timeline be for resubmitting, you know, no, um, or restarting the RFP process? We don't have time for this year. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to fit it into this calendar year. You know, you can look at it next spring, and next at the end of the year. Um, and I also want to mention that the uh, Pullman, the, the others that applied that only showed labor experience, we can't base our things on what they should have filled out. You know, I just want to make that clear. We know they're capable and other, but that's not who they had available for this. Um, so I just want to make that very clear. We cannot base it on what they should have done. But uh, um, Manager Burt, how, what do we, like, I feel like uh, as just as a counselor, I, I don't know what they didn't fill out. Is there anything you can provide yeah, to us? I, well, that's what I mentioned it. They, the uh, only, what you had to detail all those categories of uses that we need, you know, the taxes, assessment, all those things, they only put in labor and employment, nothing else. They, they didn't put anything else about anybody that specializes in anything. Um, same thing with another firm that's a very small firm that would never have the ability to take it on anyways. And then the third firm did not list the, who would actually be the town attorney as they were required in the bid package. They did not include Appendix B for, you know, for debarment, that type of thing. Um, you know, the same process we've gone through, this is the most transparent process I know of that's ever been used by the town. Um, you know, it's ever been televised, you know, recorded like that for people to see ever. Um, I also mentioned the same night that we decided Um, auditor, which to me shows how political this has become. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to uh, reconcile the two myself. Councilor Kassiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Burt, do you believe that you properly advertised the RFP process well enough to receive adequate responses? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, are, I, you somewhat answered my question, but um, are you aware of any other towns that normally videotape their RFP processes for attorneys for the residents to view? Never heard of one. We've never done it for any other bid here. Okay, thank you. Do you believe that this was a fair process? I do, 100%. Did anyone on the panel ever express that they felt that the process was unfair? No, we made sure everyone was unanimous and agreed on things. Were the questions um, for each firm the same, give or take? Yes, they were the same, um, you know, taking timeline in, into account. Uh, the only real difference was one was asked uh, if you were successful, what, how would you transition? Others asked if you were successful, how would you tra help transition? Okay. Um, the human resource director was present and actually a part of the oh, panel? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So she was there to guide the panel and... Right. She was the one that really we count on judging their labor quite, uh, answers. Okay. And she was there to guide you on any sensitive or confidential information? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, was there any shown favoritism towards our town attorney? No. Absolutely not. And were any of these scores altered? No. So it is very obvious that the majority of the panelists preferred Sussman and Shapiro? Correct. Okay. Um, this if, if you watch the video, you, you'll actually see the wide gap between the two. Okay. So this literally has been the most transparent process the town has ever had for an RFP process for an correct. attorney? Okay. And the reason that the other firms were not ever considered was because they did not properly respond to our RFP proposal? and they didn't provide proper documentation. That is correct, and we're handling it the same way we've always handled it throughout every bid, and I would never deviate from those standards. I think those questions... We will get legal issues if we did that. Gotcha. I think those answers speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have hands on Zoom or no? I don't see any. Okay. Can we change the view so we can see everybody? Councilor Bordelon? Um, that's right, do it. You can do it. You're good. Um, thank you. I mean, I guess I find it offensive if I'm going to be point of order on the fact that I spoke about a numeric number that's in, in my chart, in my papers to be reviewed, stating someone's scoring. If the town manager is going to state that he finds it's politically motivated, 
I find that extremely offensive. All right, let me, and, and, let me just jump in real quick. I think quick. that's very offensive. That's so okay. I think it's not appropriate for the town manager to bring politics Johnson. into the situation Counselor, and say it's Counselor, politically motivated. Counselor politics Barron, have me, been brought into this process. Councilor let me just take the floor real that's quick, it. okay? Um, I think the town manager was making a point about how one RFP process, uh, one went out for bid, the other did not. Um, I don't think uh, uh, any, he wasn't using a pejorative when he meant political. I think he was just explaining the differences. Um, do you have anything else? Yes, I also was in voting asking for the auditor to go out and I did not get the support. So I just think you know the wording could be used a little bit differently there. Um, I thought that the auditor should go out to bid as well, as again, it's in very important yeah. for transparency. So, um, so my motivations were not political in nature. Yeah. It's been the same ask that I had for the last four years. So speaking for myself, I asked for the auditor to go out to bid, I asked for the attorneys to go out to bid, and I've asked for the, the last three years. So yeah. um, for me, you can speak to other people, but I have a right to defend myself and say, my, my reason for doing this is not political or politically motivated. Understood. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Franco. So I hear, well, this isn't four years ago. Well, you know what? I went through the process four years ago. You haven't. Other people haven't gone through this process. This is it. Everybody here can have their ideas of, oh, we should open it up. We should have a big kumbaya moment and bring in all these attorneys from all over the state and, and sit here and have this in-depth discussion on all this. That's not how you do an RFP. There's a process. We followed the process. We were told what the process is. It is what it is. This is how you, you do it. So, do like, now. I just think sometimes this gets way out of hand and it goes way off onto these policy talks when it's actually, this is what we received. This is what you got. Look at it. I mean, y if you think somebody in here is better than what we have, defend them. Defend those, the, per the attorneys that applied then. Say who you think is better. Defend why they should be the ones. So don't sit here point and say you're, you're upset point with of the order. process. Point of order. What's the point of order? Councilor Franco has the floor. There's a lot of rumbling going on over here. So don't say you don't like the process and all this other stuff. Defend one of them. Bring it up, look at it, defend them. Point of order. Instead of sitting. State your point of order. I'd like you to rule on the, my last point of order, please. Point of order is well taken. Councilor Franco, you have the floor. Thank you. So <laughs> defend one of them. Don't sit here and cry about the process, because you know what? The process is the process. It's a legal process. This is how we have to do things. So defend one of these attorneys. Defend one of those, those and say why you think they should be the attorney then. Get over the process thing, because what we're here is, the actual topic is town attorney selection. Not town attorney's you know, process of how to select one. It's the selection. So defend one. I can, I, I hear p tons of reason to defend the people that we have right now. So, defend it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Parker. I was just gonna see if we can move this along. Um, I believe we still have other agenda items. I'm asking Mr. Mayor if that's possible. I know I can't move the previous question so that we can decide on the motion on the floor all right yeah we cannot move the question um we are at 8 35 um and we have a lot of other agenda items i do have a couple other hands i'll call on Co uh council westerville first okay uh thank you mr mayor you can't defend someone whose paperwork is not there in front of you so that's kind of a ridiculous thing to say uh, crying about the process no I expected so I expected more I expected something to be more wide open so I apologize if I've offended someone but in this environment that's the way I feel and I feel I, that I have a right as a town councilor to state that all right thank you councilor Jones um, 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'd just like to speak a little bit, because people are questioning about the scoring process. Um, let me just speak a little bit of how that was done and, and what we felt on it. For Sussman and Shapiro, they brought a team of seven people. The reason they received the scores they did is because they brought the experts for each one of those different areas that we were dealing with. So we had the real person who was the one who deals with the town as part of the team in the room who could answer the question. The other firm, Halloran, did not bring the people. They apologized for not having the people over and over and guessed on, the, on many of the answers. So if you watch the tape, you'll see that they say, well, I'm sorry, this person isn't here, but I'll take my best guess at doing it. So it got greatly affected the scores when you had one team that's bidding that doesn't bring the right people and apologizes constantly for not having the people and another team who brings an entire panel of experts and answers every single question exactly. So the scores were very reflective of the team that was sitting in front of us, and we were able to get the scores that we were able to get the answers that we needed from the, the, the relevant department heads to the team member on the other side of the attorney. So that is why you see the scores the way they are, because we had them in the room. Thank you. Councilor Bordelon? Um, thank you. Just speaking to the last thing, um, you know, stating that, you know, defense, well, unfortunately, only one counselor was allowed on the RFP process. I have papers that, you know, just have questionnaires, um, and it was narrowed down to two. And as it was stated, it's, you know, the current attorneys that we have are the ones that um, did better than them. I'm not doubting that. I just wanted a bigger pool. And seeing three closed out, so yeah, so if, if, you, if Counselor Jones states that, um, if the case, which I did watch the video, what happened, then, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that the one that we're left with is necessarily the right one. I mean, it, that's just. If they can, I can't, because if that's all we have, what I'm defending, what I'm asking, is that I thought the pool should have been a little bit more open, a little bit more broader, a little bit wider, and much more uh, opportunity to, um, much more opportunity to see uh, more of the process as far as, um, you know, it's kind of like, for me, it's, could if, if there was at least two or three more in the final, and this is where we end, it would have changed, it could have changed the outcome drastically. But my point is, is that when you have such a huge difference in scoring with only two in the remaining field, it's hard to kind of see where the clear line is as far as like, uh, you know, what else could have been gotten if we had an array? Um, sometimes, you know, when you pick certain things, it's in, in a scoring or, or whatever, you might pick the higher one, but it, when it, sometimes when you're hiring, it, you, 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 you think you're picking the most qualified, but sometimes, like you said, the pool is so low, so you're taking the better of the pool. And, and I'm not saying what we have is not great. I think with the community or what I wanted, was a greater pool. So as it was stated, it's hard to select from this. I wasn't part of the selection board, one counselor was, and the other three weren't given a final interview, and it was down to two, so hard to defend there. And that's that's my only point. Thank you. Councilor Westerville. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I just wanna make one thing clear, okay? I wasn't questioning the scoring, and I wasn't questioning who the two candidates were. I was questioning the process because I did not feel that the process was open. So there's no reason for attacks. I'm just telling, giving you my personal opinion that I think the people of Groton were expecting more. I was as a town councilor, and that's where I stand on that. Thank all you. All right, seeing no other hands, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Carry that. Okay, that carries six in favor, three opposed, Bordelon, Baumgartner, Westervelt, zero abstaining. Can we take a break? All right, we'll recess for 10 minutes and be back at 8.50. Recording.
on to 2022-95 affordable housing plan can be found on page 250. I'll make a motion to recommend a re resolution to refer the affordable housing plan to the Planning and Zoning Commission for review and input and schedule a public hearing for April 5th, 2022 town council meeting. So moved. Kasiri second. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Kasiri. Um, and we have Director Reiner here uh, to give us some background. Good evening, everyone. Uh, also here with me tonight is uh, Paige Bronk, our Economic and Community Development Manager. So uh, very briefly, uh, the town of Groton in 2021 began working on two different housing plans. Uh, one of those plans was a housing market study, which we presented to the council back in the fall of 2021. And that uh, plan looked at the entirety of the housing market and what was needed for housing within Groton between now and 2030. And this draft affordable housing plan that we brought to you tonight is the second of those plans that we were working on. Um, this housing plan looks specifically at the topic of affordable housing versus that larger market study looked at the entirety of housing in Groton. The state of Connecticut under Connecticut General Statutes 830J requires that every municipality adopt an affordable housing plan. Unfortunately, the state did not give a lot of specific guidance on what's needed in an affordable housing plan, but the state goal is that for every municipality to have at least 10% of their year-round housing stock as affordable housing. Groton has approximately 23% of its year-round housing stock as meeting this definition of affordable housing. In order to adopt uh, or uh, draft this plan, first the town had applied for a grant from the state to get some additional funding to assist in the development of the plan. We received that grant and the town hired RKG Associates to help us draft the plan in conjunction with the town steering committee. Uh, the plan looked at community needs, housing gaps, and also growth projections. Uh, there were a number of public members on the steering committee, including two town council members at the time, Leanne Overy and Conrad Heed, uh, Beverly Washington from the RTM, Ali Starkley from the RTM, and also Natalie Burfoot from our Community Development Advisory Committee. They all participated as part of a steering committee for this project. In addition to having a steering committee, we had a number of public outreach meetings. Uh, we had two public workshops, which were held on Zoom both in April and in June of 2021. Uh, both of these were streamed online and are still available on YouTube at this point in time. Um, hold on a second here, just pulling up my notes. Give me a second. Um, the housing report contains key considerations and findings as well as recommendations to increase both our deed restricted affordable housing and also more housing that is affordable in town but is not necessarily deed restricted. This plan has a tremendous amount of information and details. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to go through it, I certainly recommend that you do that. For example, some of the key highlights, uh, there's an executive summary that starts off the plan. Page four discusses the key considerations for Groton and housing. Page seven discusses key findings from the demographic and housing market conditions. And page 52 has a summary matrix of recommendations within the plan. We can get into some of the more detailed recommendations uh, tonight or in the future, but really what we're looking for now is our next steps moving forward would be to forward this, this plan to the Planning and Zoning Commission for their review and input. This is not something that's required by state law, but it's something that we certainly recommend. Also, the state law requires that we hold a public hearing on this draft plan prior to adopting the plan. The plan does need to be adopted prior to July 1 of 2022. At the public hearing that we would have for this plan, we certainly can give a, a more detailed and thorough overview of the plan if the town council wishes. Um, and with that, we could get into more details. Uh, Paige and I are both certainly prepared to discuss that, but uh, we wanted to kind of open it up for uh, any questions. Uh, before that, Paige, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, thank you. That, that was a great overview. Uh, I, I just wanted to reinforce that there is significant detail within the document. Each page has uh, a lot of data, uh, significant use of infographics as well. So. 
it is definitely uh, recommended that people dive in and um, every time we read it, we actually learn something more. So uh, thanks. Thank you. All right, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, thank you, Mr. Renner. I completely agree. This is incredibly detailed um, report that you've put together. So I just, I have two questions. One is most of the first half of this report um, runs up to 2019. So I just, could you weigh in and just talk a little bit about how COVID completely changed the world and what we do? And so things like home purchasing power and household income, I'm going to assume that some of those numbers have changed and they're not really reflected in this report because you have a few things after 20, 2020, but most of the things run up to 2019. Sure. So uh, things go up to 2019 because that's the, what data was available at the time uh, through all of the kind of national sites that everybody uses uh, to, to develop these types of plans and to get accurate representation of what's out there. I think any of us that have been following the housing market, uh, the real estate market, knows that COVID has definitely put uh, an additional strain on all types of housing. So if anything, the recommendations in this plan, as well as our larger housing market study, are that much more relevant because housing values have increased substantially, rents have increased substantially. Uh, I, I think it actually lined up very well. We did not plan it this way, but it was great that we had a presentation on the revaluation earlier in the agenda because you heard some of those increases in residential value and then also as people refer to multifamily as commercial because it's taxed commercially and it's often looked at from a real estate uh, portfolio perspective as commercial but those are still people's homes and rental is really where we've seen some of the biggest growth in income for people that are looking for rental income that's one of the highest areas we've seen that the income of people looking for rentals within Groton has substantially increased as well as the rental rates have substantially increased within Groton. Uh, the the second question I have is at the end of at the back of the report you have some different goals and strategies can you just talk a little bit about how those get implemented um, once this plan is approved how you implement them into is it with developers how you who you pick is it master plans just what what do you do with those recommendations and how do they get implemented uh, sure uh, certainly so there's a number of different ways of implementing those plan uh, those recommendations so some of them will be easier in the sense that there might be zoning changes to encourage some of these policies you know zoning changes to encourage housing growth um, you know encourage the mixed middle housing option for our zoning, uh, looking at additional policies on accessory dwelling units. Those are all what I would call some of our lower hanging fruit, things that we can do regulatorily. Things start getting a little bit more difficult when it, okay, how can we start leveraging public land for housing production? How can we um, look at other options and initiatives that are gonna start costing money? That's where things get a little bit trickier, but. I think some of these things are first addressed through our plan of conservation and development and our zoning regulations. Others are going to be policy items that we will bring to the town council and RTM in the future to discuss or to the planning and zoning commission to discuss. So there's really, there is no one silver bullet of implementation, but it's really, you know, in, even in that uh, matrix on page 52, there's the short term zero to two years, the midterm three to five, and then that long term of six to 10 years. And, you know, some of it, it's, it's further um, utilizing the services and items that we've already done, community development block grant with a lot of our housing rehab. And we also look for emerging opportunities, uh, such as things like ARPA and the funding for that and what that can do for our housing stock within Groton. Paige, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything else. I think one other point um, deals with partnerships. So you have public, you have private, sometimes public-private, but also partnerships with nonprofits. Um, we do partner regularly with nonprofits, particularly with our CDBG program. Uh, we do that many years, and um, 
recently we've been communicating with the Groton Housing Authority about the next round of CBD funding. Do our best to uh, rehab and hopefully in the future add more housing units. So uh, that partnership component I think is really important. And, you know, one of the things that I think further hits home, and I, I know uh, one of the council members had asked a question on the reval about new housing starts, new single family housing starts, that in 2021 we saw seven new housing starts. That's a pretty low number, and that's been kind of the ballpark of where we've been for a significant period of time. So when we think about all the hiring that's happening at Electric Boat General Dynamics and just you know how COVID has changed some of the um, the makeup of households. You may see, um, in, actually, one of the things that this housing uh, affordable housing study had noticed is the increase in single person households, and we don't have a lot of housing available for that um, that type of living. So that's something that there is more of a need for. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor McBride. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But I do. I just want to reiterate: this is what is a fantastic read, and thank you for the level of detail that this analysis provided. Uh, just a couple of comments, and I think you hit on it, John. Mike, I guess my question is on 52. The summary. I, w I was just wondering with the with the increased ARPA funding that's becoming available, and potentially something that was on a council agenda a few weeks ago, but I think it was was changed. Well, was the, the change the conveyance tax providing potentially providing some additional revenue? If we could look to see. You know the promoting promoting the rental assistance program and the first time homeowners buyer you have that in the three to five years if there could be some consideration to move that to a shorter term because a lot of this is funding uh specific to funding requests and now that there are arpa and potentially other areas maybe that could be done because I, I i at least would like to see that uh considered so but again thank you for this detailed proposal this detailed analysis appreciate it yeah uh you're welcome and you know i, I think that's a great suggestion when this plan was being put together none of us were dreaming about ARPA or even knowing that that type of funding was gonna be available. And if that's something that the long-term recovery committee, the town council uh, and, you know, and others wanted to speed some of these items up. Again, these are recommended timelines. They're not set in stone. It's not an ordinance. It's more, this is what we think would happen because as we're putting this together, that, um, that funding option was not necessarily out there, but it doesn't, mean we couldn't speed up some things if the available funding was there. Thank you. Council McBride, are you done with your questioning? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Bordelon. Um, thank you. Um, I was gonna actually ask some of the similar questions regarding the first time home buy buyer um, options and looking at timelines and kind of uh, presenting this along with long-term recovery. Um, I know it says affordable housing, but where is the structure or incentive on um, low-income housing? Is that being articulated anywhere particular in this document, or is that going to be another presentation? So low-income housing and affordable housing are uh, synonymous. Now, there are many different categories and classifications. When we talk about affordable housing, we will often talk about two types of affordable housing, affordable housing with a capital A and lowercase a. And what I mean by that is affordable housing with a capital A is that meeting that state definition. And that's what we often think of 80%, um, someone making 80% or less of area median income. And then there are certain brackets below that um, looking at you know low income very low income you know it, and as you kind of break down in that spectrum versus affordable housing which we just think of with a lower case a which is just housing that's affordable to people but isn't necessarily deed restricted or having some type of a, um, a guarantee of its rate always being affordable one of the other items that we um, saw come out of this particular housing market uh, affordable housing study it also popped up in our housing market study and i think we can all see it in what's happening with the real estate market is due to a lack of supply of housing across all price points we're seeing a lot more people come into our markets uh, at the higher price point and they are then buying up housing which would then normally be more affordable to middle-income households 
which is then putting the middle income households buying of housing that would have been more affordable to lower income households. And it's just been a really uh, unfortunate trickle down of shrinking the, the housing supply across all price spectrums. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Can I add? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. But I just compliment, uh, comment on that just to add um, that this is somewhat of a supply and demand uh, issue as well um, at both the high end, uh, higher income, and the, the lower income markets as well. The um, the study, the, the plan actually indicates, it's on page 18, that from the years 2010 through 2019, Broughton lost 146 housing units. Now that's over um, a broad spectrum, but in conjunction with us being flatlined uh, demographically from a population standpoint and actually losing population over decades, plus losing housing stock, that puts significant pressures on both renters, homeowners, um, particularly lower income, but but even higher income have a hard time finding housing stock. So it, it, there is a significant supply issue that we're facing that has to be addressed across um, a, a wide income spectrum. Um, yeah, thank you. Um I think one of the concerns that I hear, and this is something I'm really passionate about, um, and I know that Groton has lacked it in many aspects, is also sometimes our low income or affordable housing is condensed to certain sections of town and not dispersed evenly throughout town, meaning all seven districts. And I just think that it's really important as we look at this to really identifying where our low income housing and our affordable housing is, and really looking at ways to make sure that we're reaching um, you know, all the districts and making them more diverse. As a person who's grown up here, one of the biggest problems was redistricting constantly per the state because of minority representation. And a lot of students were moved about the district to meet the needs at the schools. And one of the ways that other towns have done a income and affordable housing is not condensed to one closed section of town that we're looking to broaden that throughout the community. And I, I just hope that you guys actually put this on the town page as well as on the uh, economic development page, Facebook and stuff, so people can view this. Because I also think it's, um, it's really important that we address those concerns and um, find ways to close those gaps so that folks can live with dignity in communities where they don't have to feel that everybody knows what they make based on where they're living. A lot of the RFPs that have come for before us when we're looking at this, I hope that this is also going to be considered as we keep saying we need more housing. But what I have not seen is affordable or low income housing or mixed income housing come into Groton. And this would be a great way to, to bring in affordable housing where you have a developer who comes in and decides to leave a certain section of housing for that. So when you look at the, the needs assessment, I'm hoping that we're thinking of that affordable housing and mixed use housing within that whole spectrum of development for our community. Um, I think it uh, allows for communities to grow together and be together on all levels. And, and that's one of the older models that we have here is sections of the town that are kind of, you know, segregated away from everybody else. So is there a plan with looking at this to use any of this as when you're, you're, you're bidding out for RFPs and stuff to look at ways to make more affordable housing disperse equally throughout our community and maybe even mixed income housing? Uh, yeah, that's certainly a recommendation within the plan to look at things such as inclusionary zoning, which would require uh, affordable housing in all future developments to a certain over a certain size and requiring a certain percentage as well as looking at some of the future properties that we have but really what it comes down to is we need more housing and we've had very little new housing built within Gran in the last 15 years um, so in order to disperse uh, some of our affordable housing as well as our you know, mixed income housing within other areas and other districts, some of that is just getting more housing. Yeah, I, and I do agree. I think, you know, there could be a need, but 
you know, in the community, I was speaking to a young woman that moved up here with EB, both of her husband and her engineers, and they chose not to live in Groton because they felt there was nothing to do, and they picked Westerly. They rented here first. So I think we, we think, and it wasn't, I said, was it the lack of housing? And she said, no. So that was just one group, but I think it's important, though, that we look at ways with the um, our development. I mean, there's good things starting to come up, but a lot of people want other items that we're missing in a you know walkable community and an area for the younger folks that we don't have here. And so we can build all the housing we want, but if people don't feel there's other amenities here, they're not going to come. So I just I, I, I worry that we may build in. in resurrect all these buildings trying to support EB, but um, you know, when you pull into Groton and you go down Thames Street, it's not a good interpretation of the quality of what we could have, and so it is a deterrer. And so I, I encourage as we look at ways to advance our RFPs and develop, we come up with a plan to, um, I don't know, we gotta collaborate. And, and, and I don't think the answer is just building a bunch of houses, but I, I do think the people who live here need affordable housing that are already here. A lot of our seniors, senior housing, and affordable housing for people who are lower to mid income. Um, but um, that's just my thought. I, I just think we have to find a way to kind of think of you know improving that quality of life with the housing that we produce. So um, um, thank you for that. Thank you, Councilor Franco. Thank you. So when this goes over to um, planning and zoning, I'm, I'm assuming they're going to look into a lot of different areas. Um, because I think it's hard to replan an already established community. Um, and when there's very little land left to um, develop, um, and we have to meet the needs of open space as well. Um, over the past couple of decades, as it's been stated, Groton's population has shrunk, but we also want to grow our business district and so that people that live here will ha be able to have shops and services and entertainment and a wide variety of, you know, to fulfill their needs that they want in a community. Um, so I think it's um, some very important things to t really consider, especially when we want to have open spaces, do we want to, do we need to have more dense housing? Do we need to put it on like smaller lots, um, more multi-story or um, accessory dwellings, put, you know, potentially in-law apartments that are in people's backyards as well and maybe have, you know, grandparents living back there or can we create smaller communities with smaller um, homes? Because maybe the McMansion style isn't in vogue anymore. And maybe we should look at maybe putting smaller cottage style homes on smaller lots and make it more of a community type of neighborhood. Um, and will planning and zoning review all these type of needs and see if these are feasible for our areas in our community? John y Kate. yes <laughs> you know a, a lot sorry I didn't know wh whoever wanted to answer okay uh, I, d I think we both can uh, weigh in on uh, some points of that but the you know the relationship between planning and you know economic development which often is the implementation of planning is a very intricate web and everything is related we often talk about how we want more investment in retail and services, uh, recreation, you know, from the private market within Groton. But many of those types of businesses and those investors are very shy to invest in an area that sees a flatlined or a loss in population. We look at opportunities for housing within the community, and a lot of this stuff it starts becoming chicken and egg because what comes first, you know, the housing or more retail and services or more investment. You know, when we look at, uh, not to get too far off topic, but just what drives some of these things, what's going to drive more housing, what's going to drive more uh, retail commercial. Three out of our four major retail plazas within Groton have not seen really any investment in them in the last, you know, a substantial major overhaul um, investment. That, that's a tough thing to say. People don't want to hear it, but it, it, that's reality. 
there's only so much that we can do beyond changing the zoning, which we've done, working with the state to create enterprise zones and you know favorable tax districts, which is in place, tax increment financing districts. That is what's the things that we can do from a municipal perspective. We also need private investment. And in order for private investment to happen, they are often looking for growth in housing and in income. So again, these two pieces are very connected. We also, the more investment we have from existing homeowners, uh, accessory dwelling units or granny flats, that's something that we've allowed within the town by right, not having to jump through any special permit processes for a very long time. We don't see a lot of accessory apartments being built. Um, cottage style zoning, we allow that in certain districts now by right. There's still things that we can do to improve within our regulations, but it all comes down to needing private investment to come in here to feel welcome. And you know, private investors and the, you know the people that live here are the ones that are helping to build and further develop our community. But people want to see a return on that investment, whether it's a homeowner building an accessory apartment and knowing that they can rent it to either family or just for income, or someone looking to do a subdivision or a multifamily development or a cottage style development. And Paige, did you want to add anything else? I do. Uh, we love mixed use development. We, we would love to see more mixed use development of density, of different income uh, levels. No one would argue with that, um, but we have some real challenges that, that John has mentioned. And then in addition, it's not a Connecticut issue, it's a nationwide issue with retail right now. It's shrinking, it's been shrinking for years uh, in terms of spatial requirements. Um, I think most consumers would notice when you go into a retail establishment, you're finding more brands that carve out a certain corner of the store. I was joking today with John, um, in CVS you could go in, you'll find that Burt's Bees, for example, they'll have uh, a certain section that they've leased out. I've, I've recently heard that Home Depot will start incorporating Petco within their store. So, you know, the idea of Miracle Mile, let's get back to that concept, is we certainly want our downtown to shine and to do better than what it is, but it's not expanding. And we have to become more competitive at the chicken and egg scenario, although we have a lot of activity in Broughton. It involves many workers who come to town and leave every day, and we need to convert them into residents. Without doing that, it's going to be more challenging to attract the vitality and the mixed-use density that is sought. So we have to do both. We have to attract the right retail, but we also have to um, build our housing stock at the same time. And. If we're building our housing stock and we have to lure, like we're trying to lure developers to come to Groton to develop, are we, are, would Groton be considered um, welcoming? Um, I don't know what it's like in that realm and what, how they basically are looking at Groton right now. Um, I, I think that years ago, to be blunt, um, there were many investors that had never heard of Broad and Connecticut. And I think we have made some significant improvements in doing advertising, marketing, branding, going to uh, retail conferences. And when we go to these conferences, it's not just retail, it, it, it does deal with mixed use development. Um, and so it's both housing developers, retail, office, et cetera, entertainment. So we can always do better in trying to make Broughton more competitive and, and welcoming. Um, but I think that we have to do a better job with packaging um, everything, what our public amenities are, uh, what we are offering, what we stand for. Um, I think we've done significant uh, we made significant strides, but we have a long way to go. Thank you. In addition, we have a problem with, we don't have a lot of good land left. And, you know, there is, the, it, it's, it's much more difficult and expensive to reinvest in existing developed areas as opposed to building in greenfields. 
we really don't have a lot of green fields left. There are a few of commercial industrial properties, some, some mixed use areas, but there's not a whole lot of that left. So it, the, the lack of good available land does make it difficult to build some of that um, mixed use development as well as property owners that are willing to sell or willing to partner. So it, it really takes a lot of a lot of pieces all fitting together very well. Right. I would assume in an established community, it's much, it's very difficult. And, and as I said, it, that's why I'm wondering about the, it, should we be looking at more density than sprawl? Because there's not much left in land. So how do you grow a community when there's not much land left to put, the, put housing? So thank and you. And in the areas that we do have infrastructure, our downtown district, through some of the zone changes we did, density can be extremely high, mm -hmm. but we really haven't had anybody wanting to take advantage of it yet. Or willing to sell. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you, Councilor Baumgartner. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. And um, thank you, Mr. Reiner and Mr. Bronk on uh, your presentation uh, this evening. Um, you know, I, as much as I love reading the statistics, I'm also a, very much a visual learner and, and appreciated the, the maps. I uh, can definitely put, put the numbers into co to context uh, a bit better. So uh, thank you for uh, your work on this report. Um, just some things that really captured my attention. Um, I, I was actually stunned to learn that the overwhelming percentage um, was uh, of housing were, were single family homes at 42% and apartments of eight units and up at 24%. So that's a total percentage of about uh, really two thirds of our housing stock are those two uh, housing types. So clearly, um, so many other housing types, you know, are whether it's two family, three family, four family. Um, are um, are not being built, and I think there's also a very high demand for that as well. Especially people who are looking to get their start in the housing market, um, and um, you know, Groton is really you know supposed to be a more affordable community compared to some of our surrounding communities, um, and and was really shocked to see that you know the rents have gone up over you know 200 percent in the last uh, 10 15 years. Um, so, you know, one thing that, you know, as much as, to, uh, you know, I agree with the points that Council Franco and Cal Council Bordelon have made on, in, about the uh, need to, um, to establish mixed-use housing, I know um, tonight uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission um, was meeting to discuss uh, a, a change to really encourage, uh, you know, trans-oriented development in, in areas that are currently, um, you know, um, uh, really only have commercial uses, you know, such as what we call downtown Groton, you know, would very much welcome uh, having a, a mixed-use development there, with, you know, that could be served by potentially rail down the road and, and uh, expanded uh, transit options. But, you know, I would certainly love to see a growth in, in those uh, other, you know, housing types. Again, the, the, the two to the three to four family homes, um, just going door to door. I mean, obviously, you have a, a plethora of the type of housing stock in the city of Groton, but I was actually really shocked to see that they're, you know, even in, um, uh, you know, in, in Old Mystic, for example, um, you know, there are um, uh, in, uh, s several neighborhoods that have, you know, uh, two or three, um, two, two or three bedroom home or uh, two or three unit homes uh, surrounded by single family homes. Um, and, um, you know, uh, w would it, maybe the question is, um, would it require, zoning changes to, you know, in, encourage that type of development in places that are strictly zoned single family to allow for, you know, a, a two or three family home to be built? Uh, yes, in, in some neighborhoods, there would be additional zoning changes required. That was something that we discussed with the Zoning Commission uh, in certain districts when we were doing the larger regulatory rewrite and uh, a majority of the commission did not feel that some of those districts were uh, appropriate to have two or three uh, unit buildings in there, even though historically in some of them there were. Um, so that was, that was something that we had a, a number of very thorough discussions on 
I'm sure if you went back and uh, watched some of those meetings, uh, or actually, no, that was pre-Zoom. Wow, sorry. Um, <laughs> listened to some of those meetings, you could hear some of those conversations. Um, but you know that that is something that we certainly could encourage in the future in our zoning regulations. Uh, so in in order to build a, that type of housing stock. Uh, you would really only be able to do it in, in neighborhoods that are zoned for for those uses. Um, but um, you know, are you seeing an interest in the development of you know of, of that type of housing stock from you know um, developers or you know some of the folks you come across in your your work? Uh, within Groton, in those neighborhoods, we haven't seen, uh, to my knowledge, a, a lot, but. I think some of it is people know it's not allowed, so they don't try to, to push the envelope on that. I think the biggest area that we've seen interest is um, the multifamily housing. Not all larger projects, some of them smaller, some of them within the, you know, the Pequannock Bridge, Pequannock Village area, or the Pequannock Village area along the Route 1 area, uh, you know, the old massage school. Uh, the village of Bluff Point. So we've been seeing some of these smaller multi multifamilies, not as much of the interest in the, the duplexes and the triplexes, which I, I think are a great housing stock alternative and can really help diversify neighborhoods. No, I think you hit it on the head. Um, you know, in the last, just last point, when you look at the uh, some of the maps with respect to um, you know, income disparity or, you know, income disparities or um, racial, you know, um, you know, uh, there's, you can see a, a, a concentration of, of races in, in certain neighborhoods. And I think, in, especially, you know, when it comes time to, um, you know, Redistricting for schools. I mean, these are things that are uh, often weighed because, our, in some cases, some of our neighborhoods are, are highly segregated, and um, you know, it, it's it's not the most comfortable thing to, to talk about. And, and certainly, you know, not blaming any individual, or it's just kind of the system that we live in. And so, you know, I would totally agree if, if we can take any steps to maybe address some of these things down the road and, and kind of um, you know talk about it in a, in a um, you know, and again, in a very open and transparent pro way, I think um, we could. I think there would be widespread support for you know um, uh, allowing for a mix of housing types, and, and really, I think any of our neighborhoods in Groton, because um, you know, as the world changes, you know, we in certain, just living in a neighborhood that is racially diverse. I think you know, um, it'd be, certainly be a benefit. I think to all corners of town. Thank you. Councilor Kassiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps this is a question for Mr. Burt, but I see that um, senior tax relief is a part of this study, and I was wondering where we are with filling that committee. Still trying to fill it. Okay, so, so perhaps. Putting, and I know Cindy's been putting feelers out, some of the council members have been putting feelers out, so we very much want to get that constituted and going. Okay. So perhaps we should use this time to plug for we need members for this yes. committee to look and, at um, and it's, senior it's tax. It's not a long commitment either. It's uh, was it 90 to 60 days? Once they start, once you start the process, it's 60 day by law period to come up with a report. So it's not a lot of commitment. Okay. Great, thank you. Council Bordelon. Um, thank you. Um, just looking at it in the town side, um, how many sections of low income housing do we actually currently have? That are I'm sorry, how many? Like sections that are considered low income houses, maybe quadplex or, or community development that are in the town side. That's not senior. Um, I don't know if we really break it out into sections. Yeah. I believe that there's a map within the report that shows generalized locations. I did, I saw of that. Where affordable housing units are yeah. throughout the town. But I, I guess my direct question is how many units of low income housing do we have? in the town side. So approximately 23% of our year-round housing stock is, is deemed affordable housing, low-income housing by the state of Connecticut and to meet the state's definition. And when you say 23%, you're including the city as well? That is of the entirety of the right. town of Groton. When we, when we do plans like this, yeah, it, this included the entirety. Um, I should also mention, uh, I didn't early on, is 
through this project, we did meet with uh, the city mayor, the city planner, and talked to them about this, uh, this plan. Yep. And the development of it, they were aware of it. Is, is there any way you could give uh, at a later date the numbers of what the low income housing percent on the town side versus the city side are? I'll see if we can. I yeah. don't know if it's broken up that way right now, yeah. but we might be able to figure that out through some. Yeah. I, I don't know if we have that as a GIS yeah. player, but let me see if we can. Yeah, because when I look at this and when I think of this, and I think of how we improve, it's important to know where that is. Because I can identify a lot, uh, certain sections in the city, and you know, when other folks I spoke to uh, about this on the town side and that diversification of having it throughout the town, it's not evenly split from what I'm seeing. And so it'd be great to see what those numbers look like, and and to know those numbers means we could act on those numbers. So when we say 23 percent of that 23 percent, what percent is in is is kind of technically in districts two and three versus the remaining uh, other five districts. Um, again, to address that need of making sure all districts, you know, um, we're looking at that. If we start to partner with Habitat for Humanity, this might be a way to look at and see that, well, districts, I don't know, four, five, seven, six, three might need, you know, these might be good starting areas to really uh, bridge that gap. So I would love to see those numbers of that breakdown of that 23%. And what are what percent is actually low income, and what percent is is considered affordable housing? Because low income and affordable are, are two different things. I mean, um, on, on a large scale, um, those numbers per the state guidelines are are very different. So it'd be good to see those numbers broken down apart as well. And if you could send that to me, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McBride. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a great discussion. I really appreciate it. And I, I think it's an important discussion for the housing and the linkage to economic development, of course. And I'm just wondering, is this, and, and, and this is uh, you know, my lack of knowledge and understanding, but would, it be, would this be the proper time to make a referral to further discuss this at another time for another evening? Because it does, it seems like it will need a lot more detail, review, and involvement. I'm just not sure if we have the time and uh, to focus on this tonight. Is that how we could move this to a referral to another time? Just kind of asking for some guidance, Mr. Mayor. Um, typically, when you make um, referrals, we do that in other business. However, um, this is uh, approving our affordable housing plan. So once we vote on this, it'll go to the, the council meeting, and then it'll be approved. If you want to have, uh, this is sort of the final plan of affordable housing. But if you wanted to have more discussion on affordable housing, you yes. yes. That was it. It's not <laughs> being we, approved tonight. Yeah, right. No, no. right. Aren't we setting a public hearing yes. as well? Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. You're right. <laughs> yeah, if the, uh, so this is just for the public hearing. Jack, so right. Yeah, what we're looking to do is to schedule a public hearing so that we can then adopt the plan. And I think the conversation tonight has been absolutely fantastic and getting some good feedback and understanding what people's priorities are. But I think then a lot of what we're getting into tonight is actually how are we going to implement this plan? And I think that's something that after the public hearing and we adopt the plan, we can then start getting into the intricacies of how are we going to actually adopt, uh, implement the plan. Um, I, I should also just uh, point out on page 36 of the plan, there's actually a mapped out inventory of the housing affordability gap in total units, restricted affordable units within the town, showing it on a map uh, basis of where those are. So that is one, and I believe that there are other maps already within this plan and charts that show that information that Council Bordelon was looking for. Um, thank you. I just found a I think you can get okay. Council uh, McBride, do you have other questions? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, Mr. thank Mayor. you. Councilor Baumgartner. Um, well, I'd like to make a motion to refer the draft plan to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a review and input and schedule a public hearing for April 5th, 2022. Isn't that already on the floor? Did you say instead of a public hearing? Uh, no, and, and schedule a public hearing for April 5th, 2022. Point of information. Yeah. Did you read the motion at the beginning? Yeah. 
So it's already on the floor? Yeah. So what, what was your amendment? Um, this was um, to refer the plan to the Planning and Zoning Commission for review and input. That's so, not the motion. Well, right. maybe he's amending, so he wants to send to Planning and Zoning and... That's in the motion. Okay, you know, I, uh, Councilor Franco yeah. is correct. Yeah, okay, thank you, sorry. No, I'm so I'm confused, thank you, Councilor just, Franco. Just to clarify, when it says alternatives, uh, so there is a recommended, so the draft motion, but um, it was listed as an alternative, so my oversight. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I, I cannot hear Councilor Baumgartner. Yes. In, into the microphone. Yes, Thank you. I apologize, uh, Councillor Parker. Um, I rescind my motion. Thank you, Councillor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Um, in response to um, economic development team, um, looking at that map, it does not break it down into you know the greater detail. It's a broad coloring, so I did review that, but it would be helpful um, still to have. I appreciate you um, you know cueing me in on that page, but it would be helpful to have a little bit more of breakdowns. Uh, per district in our town as it's broken into seven and kind of seeing uh, a little bit more broadly and pinpointing um, so we know exactly where we're lacking on affordable housing uh, in certain sections of town. All right, thank you. I'm seeing no other hands, so I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That carries unanimously nine in favor, zero opposed, zero abstaining. Thank you, Director Reiner and Mr. Bronk. <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right, moving on to 2022-97, any Edge Data Center host municipality fee agreement first review. That can be found on page 326. And Mr. Bird, if you can give us some background on this. Sure. As you may recall, uh, Tom Quinn with uh, any ledge uh, attended the last meeting to give an update. Um, he had indicated he would uh, send an updated draft. It's uh, at least 95 percent the same as the one we had with Got Space, but he did include language on uh, the noise, some environmental stuff. We did ask for some further things that are incorporated. Um, and after speaking with the mayor earlier today, we're going to have Eric. Uh, first touch on what things are different from the got space contract and we'll go from there i do want to make it clear to the public there's no action requested tonight this is just a first read of a first draft <laughs> so uh, i want to make that very clear and to remind people that the uh that there will be a presentation and public input and question um period this thursday at i just believe 5 30 right 5 30 right <laughs> yeah 5 30 in this room in the cedar center Thank you, Town Manager Burr, and uh, good evening, Mayor Melendez and members of the Groton Town Council. Um, so as Town Manager Burr mentioned, the um, Town of Groton approved a qualified data center host municipality fee agreement back, I believe it was in March of last year with Godspace Data Partners. And this, uh, that agreement was used as the template for the agreement proposed with New England Edge LLC, which is a Connecticut limited liability company. Um, as background, uh, the state of Connecticut enacted legislation, Public Act 21-1, to incentivize the development of large-scale data centers within Connecticut, which act became effective July 1, 2021. And that legislation requires that either an owner, operator, or co-location tenant of the qualified data center enter into a host municipality agreement, which is what this is intended to be. Uh, so the differences between the previous agreement and this agreement are uh, one, there's a different entity involved, uh, two, uh, as uh, shown on page 327 of your packet, there are uh, there's different real estate that's involved in this agreement. <coughs> uh, 
uh, we, we added some language on page uh, 329 of your packet. So it's section uh, one, uppercase B, lowercase A, that um, if the DECD approves an agreement that varies the real estate in any way, it has to come back to the town for approval. Uh, significantly on uh, page 330 of your packet, there's a subsection D, which requires the facility within 180 days after a building uh, begins operation as a qualified data center to attain certification under uh, certain green build building standards and then to continuously maintain that certification throughout the term of this agreement. And there's uh, five different uh, standards that are referenced here. And this is one of the areas where, um, you know, we're, we're certainly uh, open to input um, and, and we're still in the process of reviewing, which we've made clear to New England Edge. Um, the This section also has uh, requirements that generators uh, meet certain EPA uh, standards. Before we go on, let me just mention, just mentioning under the certifications, there originally was eight on the list, it's been winnowed down to five, but these have been sent to GOSA, GCA, just, yeah, I'd like, so, you know, some are more restrictive than others, and I, you know, I, I would like to have a better feel, you know, to make sure it's on the more restrictive side, so I do anticipate changes to come to this. Thank you. Um, and then we added on page 331, the last paragraph of D, um, regardless of whether the green building standard certifications require these uh, these items, we added in certain requirements. For instance, um, no PFAS will be utilized for fire suppression on the site. And just to mention, that's not the standard anyhow, but we just want to make it very clear to everyone and the public that that would not be allowed. All right, so we specifically added stuff um, just in case the green building standards did not have that in them. Um, if the agreement with the state terminates, this agreement automatically terminates. Uh, section 332, I'm sorry, page 332 of your packet, subsection H, there are uh, noise control standards which are um, added to this agreement and which um, we are also still in the process of reviewing. Uh, there's a, on page 334, subsection I, there's a requirement to donate a minimum of 50 acres to Groton. And just to point out, we did add in there that uh, there must be access off of Hazelnut to get to that, as well as about the open space to the south. We want to make sure there's not a gap between anyway. Um, this is a, a minor change, but page 337 of your packet, subsection E, uh, because the prior host agreement was entered into before July 1 of 2021, which was the effective date of the legislation, this section read differently. So now the effective date is when it's signed by all signatories. And then uh, page 347 of your packet, section nine, we added additional language to the assignment section, which um, requires consent for um, transfer, internal transfers of um, management control or beneficial interest in New England Edge. And I believe, those were the substantive changes between the prior agreement and uh, this draft agreement. I just, I just want to point out a couple other quick things on 339 under the uh, the uh, things we added for environmental things. We did also add things like uh, no, is the um, what page was that on? Sorry, with the front page. What page is the uh, environmental things? Uh, 330 is where the... Oh, there we are. 
We also added no power supply batteries shall be disposed of on the properties because we know these things have to be changed out every 331 back under the environmental uh, with the, that main top paragraph. Um, no power supply batteries shall be disposed of on properties. So we know every two to three years you have to change out all those batteries. We want to make sure they're disposed of properly. Um, obviously making sure chemicals are stored, uh, any chemicals are stored properly. And then we also, uh, there's a ton of boxes that go through these <laughs> places and we want to make sure they're recycled and not saved on site. So, and I do anticipate there'll be more things to come as we continue to review it. But those were the things in researching that came to mind initially. All right, thank you. So I'm just gonna say, just starting out, um, this data centers thing is a huge topic, but tonight we will just be discussing um, this host fee agreement. So um, just please be cognizant of sticking to just what's in this uh, draft agreement. Council Board along. Uh, thank you. Um, when looking at this host agreement, thank you for pointing out the connection with the uh, God space agreement. Uh, so nothing in this agreement is going to cause any legal issues um, if God's, uh, God's face decides to enact their document that they currently want to open with us. Uh, a lot of the similarity things and things that we agreed to God's face um, under this agreement are, are much similar. And, I, and I'm looking through this and look to the attorney's opinion to make sure that we're not going to run into any legal issues um, by making sure something, for example, that a person um, was a part of before, they have the right to switch, but requests and promises made, and this new person, which was part of the executive session when we had got space, okay, so this new person for new in, uh, any edge came to us and was an executive session to discuss God space. And there were things that were said, which I can't say because you can't talk about executive session. But I just want to make sure that the things that were discussed there and now we're moving that he was privy to, right? So just because he's now with a new company, he was privy to the information in the contract agreements under God space. So my concern is now we're, we're agreeing to a contract for another data center. So it's not just the issue of Groton agreeing to data centers or not. It's not a matter of if you like them or not. It's a matter of is Groton wanting two because the other one is not done yet. So by accepting this one, we then would be in contract with two data centers in the town of Groton. And therefore, this gentleman, no discrimination for his right to change. He has every right. But with that change comes attorney privilege that he had from hearing and knowing exactly what Godspace, Godspace's plan was, negotiating and talking to us in executive session, what they're looking to do, and now he has all that information. So my question and my concern is where do we stand with all of that? Because that, that's a big, you know, a big decision to make and, and making sure that we don't fumble the ball here in the sense that we made some promises to God's, God's face on those properties. And um, you know now this new developer with the same head, uh, same person, different name, uh, was a part of that. So uh, currently, where do, where do we have concerns with the two contracts running parallel and with these two now, uh, I'll call them two new, two developers, one that we've had and now we have a new one. What, what concerns could come up, or if any? So uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think part of it is a business decision that, that you as, as town councilors need to decide, and, and part of it is a legal question. The, the business decision is do you want uh, two different agreements, two different um, entities in Groton that contemplate data centers? So. Um, that's that's certainly for you to decide legally the agreement with got space does not uh, require the town to have an exclusive data center relationship with got space it doesn't prevent the town from entering into a different agreement with a different entity involving different properties that contemplates a data center um, i can't speak for the individuals that are involved with Godspace or any edge and the commonality there. 
there's uh, certainly litigation that's going on with some of these individuals. And, um, and I, what we have in this agreement are representations that any edge is making in favor of the town that um, indicates that there is no litigation that prevents them from going forward with this agreement. And um, if those representations are breached, that then the town can take certain recourse to, um, to say that there's a breach of this agreement. So I, I certainly can't guarantee that um, <coughs> the individuals that are involved with the different entities uh, don't have some they certainly do have issues with each other. I can't uh, guarantee that they won't say that the town shouldn't be doing something or not. Um, there, there seems to be some pretty litigious individuals involved. So. Yeah, so, right. So I guess there's some uncertainty there then in the sense. And so there was no land promise to God space that now any edge is wanting um, you know, for right-of-ways or any other promises that were made under the other contract that we would be, you know, uh, you know, now trying to, if we were to approve a contract as such at a later date, um, that we would, there would be a conflict there either. Because I know there's right-of-ways that have come up. Those right-of-ways are not anything that we've promised to the other company. That first agreement is off of 117. These are totally separate properties between Hazelnut and uh, Flanders south of uh, 95. So they are totally different right-of-ways and properties involved. So there's no crossover there. Um, and just to mention, too, uh, before you could build anything, you'd have to have that power supply agreement with GU. Um, if you, and there's only a certain amount of electricity available, so you're not going to likely, unless they both built very small ones, I don't believe there's electricity from what I've heard to actually build two decent size uh, data centers. Mm. Uh, so unless right. they each just did you know, like right. whatever the lowest level is. Right, and that's my next question. Mm -hmm. Looking at this and the power agreements, um, can Groton support two data centers? I mean, that has not been evaluated. And so my concern with agreeing to a contract until Godspace either completely pulls out and ends our contract, I feel like we're kind of a, a, like jumping ahead too fast. Um, you know, I can support a data center, you know, in its natural state with a lot of other restrictions and things in, in contract, but where I draw the line and I get a little confused is agreeing to a contract with this company and then what's going to happen with the other company? We could stare down the barrel of some litigations possibly if we can't support two data centers. And so when approving this one and looking at, you said, you highlighted the areas that I had highlighted that um, I had concerns with where um, you state where the things were different, especially on page 347 under assignment, and uh, that was one of the things I had highlighted, making sure if the hands change, what's our protection rights. But my concern is Godspace is not an ended contract, is that correct? As far as, I mean, it's still open, we have not closed that. So looking at power sources and what's good for the town, everyone keeps talking about the tax revenues and all that, that's great. But my concern is we have an assessed to see that we can handle two power sources here, two data centers, so I'm afraid to approve a contract for another company with one open. So I'm just con concerned about that, and I don't know if you can speak to that. Based on the old agreement that doesn't have these this language in here that you said that was added under this new one, the Godspeed's uh, agreement does not have this new language in it that this, you know, that, that's been approved by the town. So they have a whole different right under their contract to, to, to have such of a, a development here. Um, so I am just a little, like, it's kind of confusing in that sense, if you can understand. It's uh, two people bidding for the same type of thing. One was a part of it. He knows everything that the other one has. And now we have a power issue. And if we, could we face litigation if we approve a contract for power source for this company before Godspace fully pulls out? And then GEU says, no, we can't give you any power right away now because we already got this any edge here and uh, we can't support both. And then they can look at us and say, Groton, you agreed to this in your contract. There's nothing protecting us. You guys knew that you couldn't support two power sources and you agreed to another source. So that's kind of where I'm going. Like I'm trying to wrap my head around how do we make that happen? So the, um, 
the, the both agreements have language in them that they're contingent on a power purchase agreement being entered into between the entity involved, whether it's Godspace or New England Edge and the, the local utility. So that's for them to sort out. It's not for us to decide the power purchase agreement components of it. Um, if they don't back out within a certain time period, then that contingency is, is void. But that's, that, that's not on you as a council to decide the logistics of the power purchase agreement. Right, and I think that's, I, I thank you for clarifying that. I think that helps a little bit, but it, it does make me have to wonder when I'm making deals with someone that if, you know, it, it would explain the urgency in which now the second one is coming to us because now it's a race to get the power purchase agreement. Does, did God space, they've already secured their power purchase agreement. I know they had an assessment, but it's a not A letter fully, of intent, I believe. A letter of intent. So they're they not the agreement though. Right, but not the agreement. So. I just, it starts to become a little bit of a slippery business and it explains the urgency to get ahead of the other one to kind of get that power source. And I don't know if that's good business or not, you know, if we know that by agreeing to something. So I'll yield for now. Thank you for explaining that. Yep. Councilor Franco. So when we approved the Got Space agreement last year, it was unanimous and that was for two data centers. Was I, am I correct? Um, they were looking at, they started with, well, you could have multiple on one property, yes. They had also, remember, looked on different, you know, different locations, but it ended up in one area. But you could, they were talking about potentially having two data centers there. Yeah, it all comes down to electricity. You know, this doesn't promise you can build anything. You could have 10 agreements on the same property. It's who owns it and who wants to actually jump through the hoops and build it. And, you know, nothing really matters till that point. Um, now, I think it's a different thing to say, could we get caught up in two people's fight? That's, I think that's a different question, and it's a point well taken. Um, but I don't think there's any promises made. All right, so um, so the contract, the, the basis, the base of the contract before adding these in, didn't we work with like five or six other towns? Didn't you get together with them, create a contract with five or six other towns, and all of their attorneys have looked at them as well, and this is the consensus of the contract that all the towns were sort of gonna go from, from as a base. At that time, the God space at one, the, not, right. the, not these updates, the God obviously, space. right, right. But the base of it We were all there. in communications making sure we had the same you know, criteria. Right, and all of their town attorneys have looked at it. At that time, right. And at that time, and then now we've added some additional things to beef it up even right. more, with, especially with environmental issues. Yes. Um, and I just want to clarify, to, because I'm, I'm hearing things in the community, in this contract, we didn't send this out for RFP. We're not asking people to come here to be a data center. Yeah. These are people that have an option on land. They want to build this. It's not. We're interviewing. We don't. We're not interviewing a bunch of data center people to ask them to come right. here. We right. don't have options. This is the. This is the guy There's who's asking reason. for it. And it has to go on industrial land. It can't go on any of our school properties. It has to be industrial. Is that correct? It has to be. Well, that's probably better a question for John. But yes, I mean it's a uh, allowed with, especially with the use permit. Is that what it? It, it's allowed in our zoning now, so it's obviously easier. I mean, could you ask for a rezoning somewhere, I suppose, but it's allowed currently. Right. And it also has to be close to the fiber backbone off the highway. It's got, you know, there's a, has to be in the GU district. Yes, there's a lot of parameters to what works for it. Right, and then if we give them the contract and they don't build, how does that hurt the town? It, it does not, as far as I can tell. No money out of our pocket, right? The, the no. property continues to get taxed as it does now um, if they don't build a qualified data center there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's just say they build it, something happens, they go bankrupt, whatever it is. I mean, it would be just like any other business. They would sell to somebody else, probably, and those new people would have to come to us and get an agreement as well. Is that correct? So if they're no longer operating a qualified data center. No, if, if they're continuing a data center and they just sell to somebody else. If they sell to somebody else uh, external to them. So if it's, if it's an internal transfer, they want to change management 
or ownership, they have to come to you as a council and say, here's what we want to do. If they want to assign it to someone outside of the entity, you know, New England Edge to some other entity, ABC Corp. Um, there's a standard in here where they have to be credit worthy. Um, I can read you the exact language. Uh, they have to be credit worthy and capable of performing the obligations of the original party to this agreement. And, um, and that's for you to decide. Okay. As a council. And let's just say it stops being a data center. It's tax, then it, the tax kicks in. That's so the fee agreement will be off the table and then the taxes of the town then kick in because it's no longer a data center. Is that correct? That's correct. And the taxes are based on what's then built there and what, what exists. And to be qualifying, because it depends on if it's 20 or 30 year that we're giving this agreement, whether they have to invest, what is it, 200 million or 400 million? Is that correct? Correct. 200 million for a 20 year term, 400 million for a 30 year term. All right. Um, I'm going to yield and let other people ask yeah. questions, but I probably have more. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner? Yes, um, and thank you, Councilor Franco and, and Councilor Bordelon, for your line of questioning. I think the more questions we ask, um, I think the better this process will be for all parties involved. Um, you know, as Councilor Franco mentioned, you know, last year it was unanimously supported by the Council. Um, I, I think since then, you know, there um, I would know at the time of the approval, we were also deliberating um, or uh, beginning to get very deep into the midst of rural school discussions, uh, wrapping up budget season, and um, it was a very busy time. And um, as a council, as a counselor, in, in retrospect, um, I, I do not believe I, you know, did the due diligence to really, uh, you know, dig in deep into the details. And so I'm glad we're, we're doing that now and have the opportunity to do that. Um, and in, as you know, uh, we had um, Mr. Quinn uh, come before us in an open and transparent fashion, um, as opposed to you know uh, meeting with having to. I'm sorry. Is there something? No. Okay. As as I had mentioned, um, you know, Mr. Quinn. Um, uh, came before us in person to discuss things in an open and transparent fashion as opposed to it purely uh, through executive session as Council Boylan had mentioned. So um, I'm glad we have this opportunity again. Um, just three points um, uh, for one, uh, just inquiring as to whether or not key provisions can be included in, in the agreement. Uh, number one, uh, the requirement for an environmental impact study. Um, you know, the number one concern I've heard from residents is uh, what will the impacts be on some of the surrounding, uh, you know, flora, fauna, and, and watersheds, um, you know, uh, just south of the property. We have sheep farm, um, you know, just, uh, you know, less than a mile away, uh, the um, reservoir that provides our um, water supply, you know, home to our, our town's water supply. and. Um, Obviously, just our close proximity to the Long Island Sound, it's absolutely critical that uh, anything we build in that area, um, it does not degradate the existing environment uh, that is, quite frankly, pristine and, and ought to be protected in, per in perpetuity. Um, so that's uh, one. Uh, number two, um, the develop, uh, Mr. Quinn has made a verbal commitment to us of uh, utilizing project labor agreement and um, wanted to um, inquire as to whether that can be codified within the agreement. That way, um, you know, there, there uh, is no wiggle room there. And number three, um, I understand it's imperative that the data centers have redundancy of power. Um, so to utilize a diesel generator or a gasoline, a, a power supply, a power supply uh, other than electricity from GU in the case, you know, um, uh, power goes out and, and the, those data centers need to keep running. If not, um, uh, you know, they're in trouble. Um, and and uh, would like to see if uh, instead of utilizing uh, either diesel, a diesel generator or um, a gasoline generator if they can uh, utilize fuel cells, um, which is a far cleaner um, redundancy power source to power um, uh, to power those buildings. So uh, those are three things. Um, I, I think my support for for the agreement is really centered on kind of uh, how how we um, 
you know, and answer those three questions. Um, thank you. Mr. Burr. I uh, just wanted to, uh, no, I think those are great uh, things to include. I just want to make it very clear that, you know, that our whole purpose here is to get that type of input and questions, you know, answer what questions we can, go back out for other questions and ask for any changes you want. We're not here to pitch anything. We're just simply here to, to respond to your wishes. Thank you. Councilor Kassirin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to um, go off of what Councillor Franco was saying a little bit, um, just to clarify for members of our community who are a bit concerned, um, the tax abatement doesn't take effect until there is a certificate of occupancy, correct? Right. So until then, it is taxed normally. There, there's language in here that um, I should point out. Well, he's looking it up. Can I dictated by the state if you do one of these agreements. So I just want to make that clear. That's not something that's negotiable. Right. So on, um, starting on page 335 of your packet, section C and carrying on to the next page, um, describes how it, it will work prior to the certificate of occupancy. Um, so for any year between the date that a parcel uh, receives approval uh, between uh, with the agreement with the DECD commissioner. So between that approval date with the DECD agreement and the date that the that Groton issues the first building permit for a building on the parcel, the payment is based on the annual municipal property tax for the parcel and all the structures on it for the grand list immediately prior to that DECD approval in that for any year or part of a year between when the first building permit is issued and a CO is issued, then that during that gap, it's 150% of the previous assessment. Okay. And once they acquire that certificate of occupancy, they begin paying the regularly scheduled fees, correct? That's right. Okay. Then it's based on capacity. Okay. Um, we received an email today, um, I believe the whole council did, about traffic concerns. Um, Mr. Burt, I don't know if you can weigh in. It, what is the employee um, ratio looking at? Is it? Um, in terms of an industrial use, this is about as minimal as you would get. Any other industrial use would be much higher than this. Okay. M Mr. Callahan. And obviously that's things the planning and zoning commission will look at. I'm right. Sure. Um, would you even recommend a traffic survey or study in this case if the employee ratio is so minimal? Or is it something that we can look into adding one, into one the One thing agreement? I want to caution on, until you're actually to that design build stage, there's certain questions that aren't going to be able to be asked. I think part of it is including things in agreement that will tr might have to be triggered later because um, you're not going to spend 250000 right this second to design it until you know these things are in place. So it's kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing, but you can trigger things along the way. Okay. Right. Yeah, um, you, you can certainly put language in here to require it down the road if that's something you want to do. Okay. I, okay. Yeah, we, we have received concern about it. Mm -hmm. um, so just want to put that out there. Um, so we'll run. I think that's probably a good thing to look at. Does the council want to see that pitch to the to them? I'm sorry, say that again. Does the council, is the council interested in us uh, running that by them with language for traffic, uh, study. traffic study down the road, you know, as a requirement? Though um, oh, I'd have to ask John, it might be automatically required by PCC too, I don't know. Sure, I would support no, that. Okay. Well, we're just, we're just going consensus right now. But I just have a clarifying question on that. Mm -hmm. um, when it was presented to us, it was said that there was like less than 60 employees or something right. like That's that. So minimal. I thought in the presentation, so. But I, uh, obviously, if P and Z needs to, you know, if they have guidelines, then right. uh, yeah. I would support their recommendation on that. But um, sure. we'll look into it a little more too, and we we'll talk with planning. Sure. That's why I'm asking. Thank you. Um, uh, lastly, um, are there any protections? Are there bonding protections for? I'm thinking of any edge goes in and starts a sewer line and then walks away in the middle of the of putting a sewer line into the fa this facility do we have protections in place in this agreement to um, protect the town from this 
We do. Um, so on page 332 of your packet, subsection G, the agreement requires both a performance and payment bond with a surety satisfactory to Groton to ensure the full performance and completion of the construction and payment for all work, labor, and materials used in connection with the construction. Perfect. So yes, it's, it's covered. Thank you so much. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> that was on section G, is that where that was? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, on page um, 331, I think it's just a, a legal term, I just want to explain it, understand it. Um, in the paragraph about the batteries, it, you mentioned Groton properties, so even though Groton controls the land underneath or what can go on it even though they own it is that just a sort of a legal way of saying it i just don't the um so that is a uh, a defined groton properties is a defined term in this agreement uh so if you go to page 327 of your packet the um, third whereas all of the properties that they contemplate will be subject to this agreement we've collectively define those as Groton properties. So yeah. that term actually doesn't signify Groton owns anything with respect to the real estate. It's just defining the contiguous parcels that they want to be part of this agreement. Okay, so even though they own it, it, it even though it says Groton properties, they own it, they can do what they, they want on it. That's that's, we're gonna say though, they have to, they can't dispose of the batteries there. So that's still a requirement. Okay, um, a question on, with the, with the God Space Agreement, we do have two agreements. This agreement, a lot of new stuff has been added to it. And it's, it's, you know, we have new environmental stuff, we have noise protection stuff, and a lot of other things that this, to me, on the surface, coming into this new, this looks like a much better agreement than the previous agreement. If for some chance the two projects did move forward, they were able to get power or do whatever they want, the gut space agreement, in, in my mind, is just like an inferior agreement to this one. Is there any way that? We could take the gut space agreement and move it up to be this same level. <clears throat> this has the energy protections and it has noise and things that seem to be missing in the other one. How would we balance these two agreements so that we could get these protections in that one if for some reason that just happened to, to come to fruition? Um, typically, you, you can't um, impose a requirement unless it's mutually agreed, but perhaps it can be done through um, zoning approvals or something of, of that nature. Um, the, the other thing is you could request it and, and, um, and seek their cooperation in that regard um, if they're going to move forward with that agreement. And there's certain deadlines they have to meet um, to keep the agreement viable. Okay. Yep. So they could, if, they, if we asked them and they were somehow able to get hold of power and able to do it. That's right. You could we, request. We could try to bring them up to the same level because this one seems a whole lot better. That's so. right. Yeah. I have a point of information. Mm -hmm. Wasn't this in the state statute, though? Wasn't a lot of this taken right from state statute? So if God's space went forward, they would have to follow a lot of this that's in the state statute. I think well, the newer stuff that you know is enhanced is our you know, either the environmental, either the environmental and the noise and stuff that's not required by the state statute. Oh. It was initially. I think it got taken out. I think that's how you remember. <laughs> On the is that. Councilor Frank, you okay? No, I'm good. You good? Um, on the, or who is determining the, the different um, energy criteria that we're using here, the Bremen and the LEED, you know, Energy Star seems to be the kind of criteria you use on a washing machine, where the other two, um, number one and number five, um, are much more detailed and specific. And both of those, the, both of those um, requirements have data center components to them. They're built around having data center components. Is there? who's making the decision on which one of these to use? Well, we're still investigating, as mentioned earlier, and I've still asked for input from GOSA and GCA. Um, I anticipate more changes, and I know, I think uh, Bream is the uh, 
I think they're that, and I think you've hit the two that are likely the most uh, stringent on it. And I, I want to go back, if I can, real fast to uh, Councillor uh, Franco's. Uh, there was proposed changes to the legislation that the state had undertaken that he's now voluntarily done. I think that's what the, where the confusion is. The state was looking at similar language. They never passed it. Oh, I was. I thought a councillor here had said that they that the. A representative up there had championed it and that it passed. So, and that they were in favor. I, I don't okay. believe that language ended up in the final version. I don't believe. Right, thank you. Correct me. I, I, I don't I think, believe so. I think Mr. Quinn indicated that that language was taken out, and he's actually putting it back in voluntarily. That's my understanding. Okay. Into this. Thank that you. Didn't, didn't succeed. So, so will, will that be a conversation also with Mr. Quinn on which one of these requirements you're going to use? Yeah. Once we get some more input, we'll be going back to them. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Right. And Thank you. ultimately, this is an agreement that you as a council is approving. So if there's a standard that you insist on, we will make sure it's in here. Right. Uh, just looking through both of them, it's either one of those two, I think, because they both have data center requirements built into them. So, but that's not, I'm not an energy consultant. Thank you. Council Bartolome? Uh, thank you. Um, I can support uh, some of, you know, the, the, the three, uh, amendment issues of, of this uh, that Councillor Bumpburner had put forward. I also think it's important that we agreed and signed that we're going to be thinking more in an environmentally friendly way as a town. And did we at, in here I do not see anything where we um, ask uh, this developer to do anything um, with the lighting around the building um, to be more, you know, like, uh, like solar lights for the parking lot or any other initiatives, um, any protections in here for that that I could not find. Well, some of those standards might cover it, uh, right. potentially cover that, but these are those are some of the things PZC gets into. What I don't want to do is something that would conflict with something they might do and right. put somebody into a no-win situation. But I think it's great, but I think we need to I think we need to research a little more. I'll look into it. Right, but as a council, we stated that we were going to be acting in a more environmentally friendly way, and when we're putting out agreements, we would be looking for those. And I right. think. As it was stated before at the last meeting, if we don't put it in on the front end, it, right. it, it, we can't go back once it goes to them. So it can be amended later, but I do think that we need to be looking at asking, um, you know, is the building going to have any solar panels or any other, like, uh, you know, the outside lining that's maybe solar? What other initiatives are they trying to reduce, you know, the carbon footprint while they're increasing in other areas? Um, I also think looking at the EPA standard two as a minimum, um, looking at the scale of the EPA requirements for um, why are we taking only the minimum? Why are we we're not, if we're, once again, we made an agreement that we were going to act in an, an environmental uh, way in the town that we're being cautious. Um, shouldn't we lower that standard? And then in another se uh, section it says level four. Different items, you know, when you look at those tiers, they, they vary. I mean, depending on what you're evaluating, I mean, zero is like completely clean neutral on one scale. On another scale, two is like the max. So for this particular area, is EPA two the highest you can you can go for that particular standard? We'll have you to can't, ask on that. Huh? We'll have to ask on that. Right, right. So I, I, I think we need more information on what those standards are, which leads me to my next question or thought. I think it's appropriate to make sure that we kind of send stuff to planning and zoning a little bit of wetlands and you know all that for an informal way of presentation of what things are already in writing that we have to do. When we involve them at, a, at, a, at an earlier stage, we do not run the risk, as was stated tonight, like with God Space's contract, and the reason that we're going with, through this with a fine tooth comb, one of the reasons I felt very frustrated with some of the other contracts and RFPs and development agreements, that's why there's things added this time. We didn't have this round table discussion before, and so that's important to know. So with that, I think the proper way to be involving them on the front end, and other towns do do that. There is a way that we can say, here's what we're seeing, like help us out here, and then they're gonna vote however they want in the end, but they can help guide us and bring them in earlier in this process and let's utilize our th those commissions, uh, the wetland and the, you know, 
uh, planning and zoning at an earlier point. Is is that legal to do in well, our town, and why don't we? I have spoken with Deb Jones and John Reiner on that. The Planning and Zoning Commission, until they see an actual plan, the most they'll do is say uh, whether you know the general concepts in keeping with the uh, with their rules, and they could a answer specific questions. You know, would you do you allow this? Do you allow that? That type of thing. But until they have a plan, they're not likely to weigh in. Right. Other than that. So maybe we're starting to get there then. So mm -hmm. I mean, it would just help because. I think it's not fair to put it all on the backs of the planning and zoning wetlands because then they can't add it into this contract. So I, I get concerned when I looked and was researching and I asked other towns, they said, oh, we always send it out to them first and have them come and present and talk and guide us because there are certain things that we should put in here now so that way when it goes to them, they can't add it. It's already kind of been signed. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm just concerned about that process. We can so, ask. If, so if there's a way that they can come before us, and tell us, like we can ask these questions under these EPA standards and level fours and all of that. I think it just really kind of connects what they're doing and what we're doing. And we're not just throwing them a huge lift onto their lap and saying, all right, now you guys, you know, be the ones to reject it because, you know, they don't want to pass it. But there's a way that they can come in neutral and just look through this with us and tell us and we can answer questions back and forth and have a working dialogue so that we make sure we're not missing something because we're not the folks that work with that directly. And then that way, if there is something, we as counselors are able to put it in on the front end. And then when it comes to them, they can reject it for all the other reasons that we, but at least we have a sound document. And so I look for guidance from the town to make sure we're covering all those steps in here. So I, I could certainly ask for Deb to send it on to them, see what they're willing to do. You know, and, and, and review this, and, and maybe there's some marking up on here of things that they're gonna agree that should already be in here or not in here. Um, but I do think we should bring them around the table. Um, the environmental section, I think, did improve. Um, to Councillor Franco's point, uh, under that section, the state kind of just said that we, they left it to the towns, is my understanding, to um, do as we felt necessary to protect our town as, as, as individuals. So it, was, it, it is up to us to decide, uh, based on our municipality, where it's located, what we want in there as protections. Mm -hmm. As, am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. Okay. And then the other thing that I'm not seeing in this agreement, which I did see in some other agreements, I looked at some data centers in different states and stuff, I tried to get outside of the area, is what happens if this data center is up and running and they you know, go bankrupt or foreclose or something? Well, that's another thing. But I'm not looking at the, vi the financial, I'm looking at the environmental. When you have high-powered wires and diesel things, People kind of just walk away. We have nothing in our, in, our, in our agreement here to protect us on the back end of how they're supposed to leave this building when vacated. Remediation. Remediation process. Just like our school buildings, when I sat on that school uh, board and we were talking about how the town leaves certain buildings and we should do certain things. There should be a standard in here that we have them say like, okay, the diesels need to be you know, drained or, you know what I mean? Like there's ways that we can protect ourselves when they have to leave. And, um, yeah, and if you see any language, please uh, forward so we can take a look at that. Is that something you've ever seen, Attorney uh, Callahan. Callahan, sorry. Yes, um, I've seen that tackled in different ways too. You can ask them to produce um, something similar to a bond or a letter of credit or yeah. something like that to um, assure that it gets done because under the hypothetical, Right. right, so that the town's not left with like leaking things and other things that are happening up there that are leak, you know, no one's surveying the area and it's leaking into our water, our watershed. So there might be a way that we can secure something here and have an expert look at this and say, you know, this should be an upfront cost that's put aside for the town in the event that this place was a malfunction and they walked away from it. It's not a building you just want to leave sitting. There's some things in there that we don't want to leach out. Right. Also, looking at from the power lines, um, cancer, I know some of the studies that I'm reading and I was also looking at, some research was done at other data centers that I'm not seeing in here. When you have high voltage power lines in certain proximity to homes, we yet don't have um, the, the, the footprint yet of where this is going to be, but where are those lines going to run in relation to homes, in relation to the sheep farm where people are walking? There are people who have, they've you know, had to relocate and move because 
the lines and things have caused cancers. Not necessarily from data centers, but high voltage lines do carry a weight when you're, if you're driving by it quickly or you walk by it quick, one thing, but certain setbacks. Um, some towns have done like a 500 foot buffer. I mean, is there any buffer requirements for these large quantity power lines per the state or per health guidelines that we're protecting ourselves on in here? Proposals from the west side, right? Right below the highway, right south of the highway. They, I know they're, they're uh, looking at doing the lines right south of the highway on the west side of the property. Um, I think, you know, fairly away from people, but we can certainly look at that. Right, so that's the other thing, is mm -hmm. making sure, like, what that's, making sure we're allowing under the environmental side that setback. Um, we're worried about the noise, but the noise is not the only health concern. You know, how far, um, uh, making sure that's in there and, and trying to find those answers to protect ourselves on the front end. Uh, and, and if it, it, and, and figuring out language to put in there, I can research the language if you guys. But I just I if mean, you come across, it, we'll research it. But yeah, yeah but I, I think that's uh, really important to have in here. Um, uh, you know, and, and what, how many feet from someone's property line do they have a right of way? I, I saw some other legal actions where folks um, had to go after you know the development because it was only like a ten foot space from their line. You know, like they they deserve the right of that. Also, you know, it was stated, um, and, I, and I know people were talking about some of the stuff that was discussed. So some people are saying only a certain amount of acres are going to be, uh, you know, mowed down. Um, but we don't have a development in front of us of a map of exactly what this building is going to look like. Do we, do we know exactly how much, how many acres this, this thing is going to be sitting on? Uh, there's no way to tell for sure until they right. have the design. So we space. don't know how much, how many right. trees are going to be plowed and how many acres. And we won't of, know that before the right. So, agreement. so the fact that mm -hmm. there's been some misinformation going around as well, saying it's only going to take up a small footprint and only so many trees, when in fact we don't have a, we haven't seen a, a, a development of, of that yet. So how can we make the promises on the front end? I, I, I know Mr. Quinn also brought that up too that it would only be a limited amount of trees because it's only going to sit on a small footprint. Um, Let me give some let's give some thought to that to how you might put in something about retaining foliage and that type of thing. So th those are my things. So I'd like to see more of that type of stuff and more information about the health impact of the power lines, the electricity proximities, the setbacks, and how much uh, of, of a space of protection zone are families that live in that area. I know that it's been stated that it is a industrial zone, and I can respect that, and other things could come in, but when you start talking high voltage power lines, you do have to look at the, the you know, how close that's coming to your house mm -hmm. as well. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Parker. Mr. Mayor, it is 1027. Could we get a roll call, please? Because I know we have one additional item, and I know this is going to be, I know there's questions tonight, and I know that we're having the public hearing on Thursday regarding this. So I was wondering if we can still ask those type of questions during the public <coughs> hearing. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Um, everyone has spoken on this except Mr. Westervelt. Councilor Westervelt and McBride. So um, if you would like to make a comment now, you can. Um, otherwise, uh, point, yes. Point of clarification. I can understand that council wants to be out by 10 and they adjourned, but this packet was 300 something. I, I did my homework tonight and I always do. And not every meeting is gonna end at 10 o'clock. Um, we, we have to be able to work through this. I mean, I think we're moving at a pace that we are trying our best, but uh, I mean, th there comes a point when we have to be willing to be here, and I, I encourage that we, we put in the due diligence and stop. Point of order. Or, thank you. What's your point of order? The, 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 cor the, the quorum about that and my intentions about that, I, I feel I was being attacked just now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Your point's well taken. Please do not speak of other counselors' motives. So, I didn't, Councilor Westervelt. I didn't speak of the counselor's motive. I understand. No. I've been listening, and I'm I'm satisfied with what I'm hearing for now. Um, I do have some more reading to do, but I'm satisfied with what with this agreement. Councilor McBride. <coughs> did Did you call on me, President? Yes. Yes. I'm, yes. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with where, where we're at. I'll save my questions uh, for the public hearing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, before, before you do it, can I just ask a question? I'm oh, sorry. Sure. 
Well, I, I, I've spoken only once on this matter. And, 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 uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we can, okay. I'm going to say consensus of the council here. If you guys want to continue, we can continue. Um, it's 1030. We have two more uh, um, agenda items, which we can go through, absolutely. But uh, I just want to explain there was sort of consensus that we wanted to move along faster. So that's what I was trying <coughs> to do. So if, if the consensus is that you want to continue on this agenda item, we can absolutely do that. Councilors? A uh, point of clarification. Mm -hmm. um, again, it was not my intent to, to speak poorly. I was just saying that we have a lot here. But my, my question is, I do not want to be what I was trying to say, and I'm not speaking about a motive of anybody in particular. I do not want to feel rushed on an island item because point of if, order. if we need to talk about this, we need point to get of the order. time. What's your point so of order? If we need it's to in our there. rules that at 10 o'clock we take a vote, and it's well past 10 o'clock, and I think that's what the council was So asking. if we're just going to take a vote, then let's take a vote. But I don't think we should rush it, and we should, if we're going to take a vote and it's not going to be, it shouldn't be to move past this item. This is a hot item that needs to be discussed. Point of order. And we need to give it this time. What's your point of order? The councilor wasn't given the floor. Your point of order is well taken. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is it the consensus of the council to continue on the meeting? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay, I've got three yeses. No. All right. Yeah. No consensus to continue on. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Point of clarification. Yep. So this item's not done then because we haven't closed this out. So this needs to come back before us to keep Right, reviewing. absolutely. Okay. We, there's many right. times we'll speak on this. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? That carries six in favor, three opposed, four along. Bumgardner, Westerbelt, zero abstaining. We are adjourned at 1031.